Print and launched Feel the Music, which is a live music show. I produce, direct, edit, um, shoot, work sound on a TV show that we have called At The Hub. I'm just looking to, to make music and to also incorporate the music with that visual, which I think people are looking to see. Bringing out the positives in Wear Him rather than focusing on negatives. That's my goal. So I have a couple of things. History, technology, and being informed and, and an edu educational mission. We do this live show and because I wanted the bands to be able to uh, have an audience. I've gotten people on the show uh, who are in various boards and commissions in the town to explain to us what they do, what are their purposes, because I think most people don't really know. I'm working on a program called I Wonder Where the Yellow Went, which is a story of Wareham sewer system. We have the show on Wednesday nights and it's great. We have uh, live acts from around southeastern uh, Massachusetts and Rhode Island. We have some interesting guests. We've had animal chiropractors, acupuncturists, human chiropractors, um, an equine assisted therapist, belly dancers. Oh, no, I have had no formal training. Nothing on a real professional level. No formal background. Nothing. That's one of the beauties of working as a volunteer at a place like WCTV. You don't need a lot of experience or any experience at all to come down and learn how to do what we do here. The expertise was here and it was it's willing expertise. I just think it's fun. Why do I keep doing it? It's a lot of fun. I'm really enjoying my time here. Keep watching. <laughs> for more information on these shows and the full program lineup for each of our stations and internet stream, visit us at www.wareham.tv.org. And don't just watch TV, make it. Thank you for watching WCTV. Tired of paying high bank fees? It's not about the fees, it's, it's really about you when you come here. Why not join PCT Federal Credit Union, formed by educators and now open to the entire Wareham community? Unlike most banks, the credit union has no annual credit card fees, free checking, free ATM withdrawals, and generally lower loan rates. And we are a not-for-profit organization, which means we can focus on serving members rather than maximizing our profit. Banks didn't know my name. Never mind that I had a husband and a son. Some banks you go, it's banking. You're doing this, you're doing your service, and you're leaving. Here, it's, it's just friendly. The people are what makes a big difference. Join the credit union family at Plymouth County Teachers Federal Credit Union. Ladies and gentlemen, if you could come in and take a seat, please. Please come in and take a seat so the tellers may take account so that we can get started.
Please come in and take a seat so the towers can take account and we can get started. Will the tellers please come forward and take account? Ladies and gentlemen, if you would hold up your cards so that the tellers may take account, you will not be counted if you are standing, and please hold them up high. Do not hold them at your shoulder or at your waist. They need to be held up so that they can see them. Please hold your cards up high until the tellers ask you to put them down. Section 1? Section 140, 40. Section 140. Section 2? Uh, 43. Section 2, 43. Section 3? 73. Section 3, 73. Section 4? Section 4, 44. 44. We have 200 registered voters in the hallway. We do have a quorum to conduct the business of town meeting. Uh, quorum being present, I will call this meeting to order. All of the rules that I gave you over the first two or three nights are still in effect. I'm just going to remind you um, of our photo policy. There is no photographs except with permission of the moderator. I have two press that have asked for permission. They will be sitting in the press section. They will not be taking any photographs during a vote. If you need to leave the auditorium, please remember to use the doorway on my left. Um, and that's to uh, protect the integrity of the meeting so that we can have assurance that we have registered voters uh, coming back into the hall. If in the event of an emergency you do need to use the exit, you're welcome to use them in the event of an emergency, but please remember come back in the main entrance. Again, a reminder, there's no food or drink at the exception of water in the auditorium. Please uh, turn off your cell phones. There is no parking in the fire lanes. If you are parked in a fire lane, I urge you to move it. And there is no smoking on school property. Again, that is the state law. Um, I am required by charter to call a roll call of the department heads. I will do that now. Board of Health, yeah. uh, Assessor, yeah. Community Development, yeah. Conservation, cons Council on Aging, yeah. Data Processing, EMS, Inspectional Services, Municipal Maintenance, Planning, Police, Police Department, Shellfish Harbor Master, Town Accountant, Town Clerk, Town Collector Treasurer, Library, Water Pollution Control, School Department. And I see that we have our Finance Committee and Selectmen on board. Ladies and gentlemen, we have about 15 articles left to go over. Uh, I, I think if we stay on topic, 
and that when you get up to speak, you speak to the motion before you. We should be able to get through these this evening. Madam Clerk, if you could pull the first number for us, please. Article 26. May I have a motion, please? Madam Moderator, I move that the town vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $780,000 contingent upon an approval of a Proposition 2 and a half override. Do I have a second? To speak to the article, please. Dr. Rabinovich. This is the first time that I'm aware that a Prop 2.5 override has been brought to town meeting. And we come before you today looking for $780,000 as a Prop 2.5 override. That is to eliminate the need to reduce our teaching staff by 19.5 members. If this does not pass, 19.5 teachers that are currently employed will be laid off. In order to get to the budget before the need for this, we've already laid off 10 other people, administrators, guidance counselors, secretaries, custodians. So there are 10 other layoffs without these 19 and a half layoffs. Last year, when we heard that there were no layoffs, the school department laid off eight people because we didn't get enough money to run the school system the way it needed to be run. In the slides that you saw in the first night, you saw that we have a deficit between achievement and funding. Our funding is below the rest of the state. Minimum funding is not enough to educate the children of Wareham. So please support the $780,000 to be placed on a ballot so that the voters have an opportunity to decide whether to pass this or not. Thank you. Thank you. May I have the vote of the Board of Selectmen? Madam Moderator. The Board of Selectmen voted favorable action, zero in favor, three opposed, and zero abstained. Thank you. May I have the vote and recommendation of the Finance Committee? Madam Chairman, the Finance Committee voted favorable action, five in the affirmative, two in the negative, no abstentions. The Finance Committee recommendation is passage in order that the proposed two and a half override may be submitted to the total electorate, electorate uh, for the town for the, their decision. Thank you. To speak to the question on my right. Thank you, Brenda Ekstrom. Um, the primary job of an education system is to educate children. We need teachers to educate. Teacher layoff should be a last resort. The school department budget includes newly created positions of highly paid coordinators, directors, interventionists, but without teachers, for whom are they coordinating, directing, and intervening? Again, the school department needs to reevaluate where it spends its money. I understand that we're below state average. Probably about 50% or more are below state average. When you have towns like um, Cambridge that, char that can afford $26,000 per student, the odds of Wareham ever catching up are considerable. However, we have made strides in this area. We have increased our funding, and all, while we've increased our funding by 20% over the last decade, our school population has decreased by 15%. We keep throwing money at these issues thinking that they're going to solve the problems. I would like to make an amendment to the motion 
to let people know that we value our teachers, but there has to be something done different in the administration, in the way that we do things. So I'd like to make the amendment to say, to see if the town will vote to appropriate contingent on a two and a half override, a sum of money to avoid layoffs of school administration, including but not limited to coordinators and or directors, and to provide funding for instructional leadership, professional development, or to take any relative action there too. Do you have that in writing, Mrs. Sexton? Ms. So may I see Yes, it? I do. Mrs. Ekstrom, in your motion, there is no funding. Is that in your intent? I'm sorry. If you could, if you could put it to see if the town will vote to raise appropriate the same amount, seven hundred eighty thousand dollars. Thank you. But for that stuff, rather than teachers, because we need to keep our teachers. Okay. We have an amendment before us. I will read it to you once again to see if the town will vote to appropriate $780,000 contingent upon the approval of a proposition two and a half override, a sum of money to avoid layoffs of school administration, including but not limited to any coordinators and or directors and to provide funding for instructional leadership, professional development, or to take any action relative thereto. To speak to the amendment. I see no one standing to, on my right. Jeff Sweat, <clears throat> Tremesit Road, District 1, and I also have the privilege of being chairman of the school committee. If, if I thought for a moment that eliminating management was going to produce a better educational experience for our children, I would do it in a heartbeat. The truth is management matters. The truth is the quality of our education is not only dependent upon the teacher in the classroom, but the guidance, leadership, support, and accountability that management provides. Not only is there a funding gap, but there's an educational performance gap. It is absolutely true that money is not the only answer, but it is also true that a minimum level of funding is a part of the problem. Our neighbors, well, let me back up. There are people who rightly say, I live within a budget. Why can't the schools live within a budget? It's a nice phrase. It even has meaning to me within my family and certainly within the family that I came from. But the Supreme Court of Massachusetts said that it does not apply to schools. Why? Because the community... 30 seconds. Because the community that a child come from, comes from should not determine the educational experience that a child has. Our neighbors in Carver and Middleborough get 52% of their school budget from the state. We get 42%. That 10% would be worth $3 million Time. to this town. Thank you. Am I right? Thank to you, Madam Moderator. Ladies and gentlemen, we can't afford to, to let this amendment go. We have to look at our children here in Wareham, our, our biggest asset. They are what we produce and the people in the management, the people in the school systems, they are the ones that are guiding our children. They're, they're guiding more children than the parents are because parents are working, some working two jobs to make ends meet. This shouldn't even be 
we shouldn't even be debating about dollars and cents here. The state mandates that we have to provide certain programs, certain, certain assistance to several different areas of children. They tell us we have to do it, but then they stop the funding. So who has the, who has the responsibility to pick it up? We do. The people in Carver, yes, they get more money, but they also pay more money in taxes. And I just found that out the other day. Um, we need to put our money in our children. If our children don't get an education, and if we're not providing the best education, the, our property values are going to go completely down the tube. We have a great administration. We have a very good school system. We need to work with it. We need to build on it. Don't, don't keep throwing stones and cutting. You seconds. can't cut here. On my left. Madam Moderator, ladies and gentlemen, Cliff Sylvia, Precinct 1. I, too, am a member of the school committee, and I would be remiss if I didn't stand up and ask you to not consider this amendment. Um, do not consider this amendment for a variety of reasons. Uh, as a lifelong educator, one that started here in Wayham in 1966, there isn't anyone that loves Wayham education any more than I do. When I have gone on the school committee, I was adamant that we have to cut administrative costs, and so we have. We have cut administrators. We have cut programs. We have cut to the bone. Ladies and gentlemen, this idea that we can run a school system without it being administrative is not fallible. We have to administer our school system. We had ample debate and discussion about the strategies that we've employed in terms of putting in curriculum leaders and enter into negotiations with the teachers union relative to teacher evaluation. Now we need the capacity to be able to get into the classrooms and enter into meaningful dialogue about good teaching and good learning. This idea that we are being wasteful at the school committee level is ludicrous. We have been able to accomplish great things on minimum school spending, and we'll continue to do the same. But ladies and gentlemen, let's be frank. We have had 34. Madam Moderator, could I have two more minutes? I will put the uh, request before the body. Mr. Sylvia would like two more minutes. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? No. You have two more minutes. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, we have had, at least to my knowledge, since I've been in the school committee, four independent audits, and they've all come back the same. They have come back saying that we are grossly underfunded, and the majority of the underfunding comes with staffing. Now, it doesn't indicate whether it be teaching staff or administrative staff. It just talks about staffing. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to staff our school department. Yes, if we were to lay off administrators and middle managers or curriculum leaders, we may be able to recoup some of the $780,000. But believe me, we would not recoup all of it. This is this article, Article 26, was a bold move on the part of the school department. We know how unpopular Proposition 2.5 overrides are. We know that. But we are committed to providing the best possible education opportunities for our kids. To have programs that I had a gazillion years ago in school not available to our kids is ludicrous. Ladies and gentlemen, I ask you to defeat this amendment. And use your common sense and use your sense of community to support those children that don't have a vote here tonight and vote for this article. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Thank you. On my right, Donna Lambert, Precinct 2, Onset. Good evening, everyone, Madam Moderator. I would like to speak to the article. My name is Donna Lambert, and I'm not a member of any committee. I'm not a teacher, nor do I work for the schools in any capacity. We moved here in 2005, and this is my first town meeting. I'm here because of a promise I made our son. He's nine and a half years old and attends third grade at Minot Forest Elementary. He loves school, and he does very well. He loves his school, 
and desperately wants to continue his education here with his friends. He is aware, however, of our concern over the future of his education in Wareham. He is worried, and rightfully so. That is why I made my promise. I promised that I would become as involved as I could to help his school and not to give up on our school system without a fight before considering other options. So here I am. Now I have been listening to everyone for days, and I have decided that I can't expect you all to care about our son's education. That is our job. You all have your own families, your own budgets to worry about, your own priorities. I understand that. I understand that saying things like, the kids are our future and it takes a village, doesn't do anything for some of you. So I would like to approach this article in a way that will apply to everyone, as well as offer some information in which some of you may not be aware, and in doing so, perhaps finding that we can move forward together and pass this article and pass the override if and when it comes to a vote. School funding is not about tightening our collective belts or living within our means, as I've heard it said. This is about cutting off the town's blood supply. 30 uh, seconds. And watching any investment we all share in the town take a nosedive, just like everyone's 401ks. I'd like to talk about the article in terms of investment savings and value for money. Investment means to place money or capital in something that gives returns or appreciates in value. Without investment, you will have no growth, and a town without growth withers and dies. People have spoken a lot to the falling property values in Wareham and the rise in property taxes. No one knows this better than we do as we purchased our home in 2006, right at the top of the house pricing bubble. There is a wealth of research that clearly shows that the investment in and performance of our town school. Time. May I have two more minutes, Madam Moderator? I will ask the body, would you grant Mrs. Lambert two more minutes? All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed? Aye. You have your two minutes. Uh, there is a wealth of research that clearly shows that the investment in and performance of a town school is directly related to property values. Just one example from the School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs at Northeastern University states that a municipality with SAT scores and per pupil spending levels 20 percent higher than average experienced a 24 percent increase in nominal home, home value. In contrast, SAT scores and per pupil spending 20 percent below average experienced a loss in home value of 11 percent. If we don't pass this article and a possible override, a fear our property values will plummet even further if that's possible. And I don't know about you, but we can't afford it. Furthermore, the main demographic that any thriving town wants to attract is young families in order to create a solid tax base, among many reasons. And the main thing anyone with kids or who is hoping to have kids wants is a town with good schools. It is a top selling point by realtors. According to the official site of the National Association of Realtors, Always advise buyers to look at the school district first because the schools drive home values up, not location. It has been proven over time that the most increase in our home values reflect directly to the school district accreditation. We need to give potential new residents and new taxpayers something else to look at where and besides the crime rate. School investment and performance, both in academics and rich enrichment programs, are also directly linked to crime rates. According to the Southwest Journal of Criminal Justice, criminologists have long linked commitment to education and school performance to delinquency and other risk-taking activities among youths. We already have a serious problem with crime that is costing us dearly. Do you really want to spend more money in crime prevention and have property values drop further? I know 30 I don't. seconds. As we heard last night, unemployment. Oh. Then there's the school choice program. This is directly related to a line item in the town budget. I just learned about this program, and I can tell you that if the town does not see fit to properly budget for our schools, we might have to apply for this program. It's a program where I can ask to have my child go to a participating school, and should he be accepted, the sending town would have to pay for these costs. Why not invest in our own town schools rather than potentially funding our children to attend schools elsewhere? Finally, we are in a global economy. That means our children have to be ready to take jobs outside our communities. Time. Could I have one minute more? <laughs> It's almost over. <laughs> <laughs> they gave you two minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Am I right? Thank you, Brenda Ekstrom, again. Just to clarify, I hear all these people saying about how schools are important. I, mean, I don't want anyone to think for a minute that I don't think they're important. I have three children in the school system myself. What I'm talking about is how things are done. We have for our teachers, we keep talking about how we're below average on funding and things. Our teachers, 99.7% um, of them are considered highly qualified. That's higher than the state average. Last year, according to DESE, 12.8 versus 13.9 to 1 was our student-teacher ratio. 
Now, you ask any teacher, they'll tell you they haven't seen a class with 12 kids in it. So therefore, these people who are being qualified as teachers to DESE aren't in the classroom, aren't with the kids. When we have the top 20 employees of the school department collectively make $2 million in salary, that's according to the FY11 um, annual report, there's something wrong. When, we can't, when, when the teachers can't get paper in the schools, but yet we're funding an average of $98,000 um, for the top 20 people in the school department, there's something wrong there. So that's why I'm not against the schools. I'm not against the teachers. But you know, we're, we're talking about parents, you know, that the two parent families working, and that you know, we don't need the parents to have to get a third job. And I'll tell you right now, when my kids were having problems with division, because it was the second time that they had changed the math program in as many years, no one was better than to sit down, and most of the teachers will tell you, than if your parents can sit down and spend time with you doing homework. That's how my kids learn division, because of the programs flip all the time. And the teachers will tell you that too. Instead of trying to do these magic bullets with these different programs and throwing money at the top level um, people, why don't we start giving it to the teachers, to the students, and we start working it that way. And if they're so concerned that these interventionists and directors and coordinators and all of these extra positions they've added on, let them put that on the ballot. On my left. Uh, Madam Moderator, Mike, Mike Flaherty, Precinct 1. Uh, I arrived a moment ago, about 10 minutes ago, and I understand that there's an amendment, and I'd like to just hear the amendment and for my benefit and the benefit of um, people that came in after me. I'd be happy to read it again. The amendment before us is to see if the town will vote to appropriate $780,000 contingent upon the approval of a Proposition 2.5 override, a sum of money to avoid layoffs of school administration, including but not limited to any coordinators and or directors, and to provide funding for instructional leadership, professional development, or to take any action relative thereto. On my right. Sandy Slavin, Precinct 3. That was my request to read it again because I'm sort of confused. Is this saying that our override would be paying for those positions listed mm -hmm. and what I just heard? I'll read it again to see. No, that's, that's all right. I think I think I heard it. It would be for administration. If that override is taken to the general public and it fails, the positions listed are the ones that will be released, correct? They will not be funded. Mm -hmm. Therefore, those positions are the ones that will lose their jobs if this doesn't pass general voting. To answer the question. Madam Chair, can, can we get a point of clarification? The town meeting votes a one line item budget for the school department, the school committee, uh, Attorney Bowen, can you help me here? The school committee determines where within their budget that one dollar amount goes. The purpose of the request of the override is to, to fund the salaries of teachers. However, if this were to go to a ballot presented such as this, and it would mean that there would be no administration left in the school, the school committee, by the power vested in it through law, would have the ability to change that they would have the ability to move money from other sources to fund those positions. Correct, Attorney Bowen? If he chooses to answer. Madam Moderator, through you, the previous speaker. Uh, chapter 71, Section 34 provides that town meeting appropriates a sum of money into what is essentially a single line item budget. The statute says the vote of the legislative body of a town shall establish the total appropriation for the support of the public schools, but may not limit the authority of the school committee to determine expenditures within the total appropriation. So once a uh, town meeting appropriates a sum of money, either uh, through the general budget or through supplemental contingent uh, override articles, if it falls within a general appropriation under Chapter 71, Section 34, 
the school committee has discretion to spend uh, as it deems necessary under the terms of the statute. Point of order. Take your point. Uh, based on what I just heard Attorney Bowen say, would that render this amendment uh, out of order? No, Mr. Flaherty. Thank you. Thank you. Am I right? I'm still confused as to what this amendment will mean. Bottom line, if it passes here, if it's put on a general ballot and passes a general ballot, other than everybody getting a 2.5% tax overwrite, what does it mean to the school if they have this additional $780,000? To answer the question, Mrs. Ekstrom. To answer the question, the intention of this is to have the teachers, um, have the teachers' salaries fixed have so we don't lose teachers and this extra money that they want to have it be contingent on these programs that they've been pushing so hard for that they're claiming are the silver bullets um, if the school department if the intention of and I and while I um, absolutely understand what the attorney stated but if the override is for a specific purpose and if the school committee and the superintendent elect to change that purpose to, um, I mean, if it passes or, or fails and they elect to rearrange things, um, you know, I think that there's a whole other issue there that we can address. But to answer the question, it is so that we fund our teachers as the bottom line and all the other things that they want to put in go in as an override. Did that answer your question, Mrs. Slavin? It's better, but I have, it brings up another question. I'm sorry. It's my understanding that if this override is passed and we add $780,000 to our tax base, regardless of how, how it might be used by the school department, that's only valid for this year. All future years, this total override of three quarters of a million will go into the general fund because it cannot be allocated specifically to the school in future years. That's my understanding. Can you just clarify That's correct. That? So what we're doing is only for this year, we're asking for three quarters of a million. Next year, that 780 will go into the general fund, not specific to the school. So we'll be back here looking to save another set of teachers salary. Thank you. Time. Uh, Mr. McDonald. Madam Moderator, to you to the body. I would urge you to defeat this article or defeat this amendment for a couple of reasons. I don't know if any of you attended the all day school budget session. There weren't a lot of people there. There certainly weren't any former selectmen there. The, the issue here is the, if you attended that meeting, you saw the amount of work that the administration, the school committee, and I guess everybody down the line put into that budget. So to think about it this way, who are we going to trust? The people that built the budget had complete transparency and it presented it during that entire day, or are we going to trust people that didn't attend that meeting and don't understand the amount of work that went into that budget? So I would urge you to defeat this article and let's get back to the original, or defeat this amendment and get back to the original article. Thank you. Am I right? I'm Eddie Pesevich, Precinct 1. It, it's my understanding, and I'm, I'm somewhat confused about this, and not too, but if the two and a half override does not p pass, we're going to lose 19 and a half teachers. And I believe the amendment said, no, we're not going to lose 19 and a half teachers. We're going to lose other positions other than teachers, and we're going to keep the teachers. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I think that's what we're looking for, is to protect the teachers. Thank you. Mr. Sweat, um, point of order, Madam Moderator. State your Could point. we have the uh, Mr. Underhill put the amended motion on the screen so we can understand what we're looking at? I have to say, I'm a numbers guy, and I have no idea what we're voting on. Sure. Um, would one of the tellers please come and take this to Mr. Underhill? Mr. 
Mr. Sweat, I believe you've used your two, two minutes on the amendment. You've spoken. On my left. I didn't want to get up, but it, it, this sounds pretty simple to me. There's 780,000 up there. It doesn't matter what the amendment says. It doesn't matter what goes. The school board can play, put the money anywhere they want. So the amendment is basically moot. So the 780,000 is up to the school committee, whatever they want to do with. Plain and simple. Am I wrong? Please tell me. We have, we have an amendment, and, and you have to act on the amendment. And if that's how you feel, then you'll need to vote accordingly. That seven eight hundred eighty thousand can be used any way the school board wants to use. Is that correct or not? Even though what the amendment says. To answer the question. The previous speaker is one hundred percent correct. Thank you. Well, then we should. I move the. I move it then. I I'm move sorry. The you, can, you cannot. You uh -huh. can't move the question at the end of uh, speaking. On my left. Donna Ashley, precinct six. You know, all of this seems to be kind of, as I believe someone said down there, kind of mute. But I think that what we need to do is we have people who are, have, as Mr. McDonald said, work very hard, hours and hours on this budget. And we have a school system that is in need, desperately in need. I know firsthand of young people who have had to claw their way up, not because the schools are bad, but because they didn't have what they needed when they were in the schools and then went on further in education. The teachers are important. The teachers are necessary. And I just would like to encourage people that trust your school system, trust your school leaders, um, and vote down the amendment and then vote for the article. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please, there's no clapping for speakers. On my right. Jim Clemmy, Precinct 4. I move the question. Thank you. We have a motion to move the question before us. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed? We now, the vote will now come on the amendment. And I'll have to read it from the screen. Uh, the amendment before you is that the town vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $780,000 contingent upon an approval of a proposition two and a half override a sum of money to avoid layoffs of school administration including but not limited to any coordinators and or directors and to provide funding for instructional leadership professional development or take any action relative thereto this calls for a majority vote all those in favor please say aye, aye. all those opposed no. the amendment fails we're now back to the main motion Article 26, that the town vote to raise and appropriate a sum of $780,000 continued upon approval of a proposition to and a half override. Selectman Holmes. Uh, thank you, Madam Moderator. <clears throat> um, I just wanted to uh, stand uh, and just remind town meeting members a few things and um, uh, four quick points, and I'll be very brief. One. Um, this article, the budget, has already been approved. It was done last night, if I'm not mistaken. So this money um, is not part of that budget. Two, um, I don't want anybody to leave here with the fallacy that because they came here tonight and voted yes, that the town automatically is going to have this $780,000 to spend any way they choose. Number three, as stated by a previous speaker, this money um, is only earmarked for the school department for one year. Mm -hmm. uh, and four, um, as Attorney Bowen so eloquently noted and previous speakers have noted, that town meeting um, has no authority uh, where this money is being spent. The you only know, thing you have the authority to do is express a feeling that you might want this put on a ballot so that you might be able to vote yes, so that we might be able to raise $780,000 and it might save a teacher's job. Um, there's a lot of mites in there. 30 seconds. Um, so I just want to bring those points, and that's what I surmise from the discussion, from meetings and other things. Thank you. 
On my right, Sandy Slavin, Precinct 3. It's my understanding the motion is what we're voting on. Not the explanation, not all the words behind it. I read that motion. It says nothing about school. It says nothing about saving teachers' job. It just says, I, I raised $780,000. I have no idea what it's going to be used for, who will control it. It says nothing about the school. Motion, I believe, controls how the article is implemented, right or wrong. That's correct. So that motion doesn't say anything about schools or teachers or anything like that. It just says, I'm going to do a two and a half override for the town of Wareham. It doesn't say how that will be spent. On my right. Howard Smith, Precinct 4. I move the question. We have a motion before us um, to move the question. It requires a two-thirds vote. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. The vote will now come on the motion on Article 26 as it appears before you. State your point. Millie Burrows, Precinct 6. In the warrant um, booklet that I have, there is a line that is not appearing on the screen that does refer to um, avoiding teacher layoffs. It's not in the motion, though. I wonder if it was eliminated accidentally. No. It's not in the motion. I see what you're saying. Unfortunately, what we have is the motion before us. As it, as it appears before you, this is what you're voting on, not what's in your warrant. Mm -hmm. So just so that we're clear. What we have before us is what's on the screen. So we're taking a vote on, the, on Article 26. As it appears, I'm sorry, but we had a motion to move the question. Uh, your point was well taken. Um, the motion is different than what was in your warrant. So what you're voting on is what appears before you on the screen. Mm -hmm. That the town vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $780,000 continued on the approval of a Proposition 2.5 override. Now just bear in mind that it's the selectman that gets to put this on the ballot. So they may be able to clarify that when they put it on the ballot, um, Madam Clark, or does it have to go? Just as this? Does it have to go on the ballot exactly as this? Yeah. Uh, State your point. Which one? Go ahead. Which one? <laughs> on my right. Uh, okay, M Madam Moderator. Um, I believe if we vote this the way it is, that the uh, Board of Selectmen would have to put it on the ballot as it is. Um, so I don't, I don't know. We've already moved the question. Yeah, I, we've I, moved I, the question. I need to take a vote on what's before us. We have moved the question, so there's no further debate. Uh, point, point of order? State your point. Uh, should this motion go either way, given the new information that was just presented, could it be reconsidered? It is new information, and it's very relevant. Yes, I would allow it. Thank you. So we have before us Article 26, as it appears before you, that the town vote to raise and appropriate the sum of 780000 contingent upon an approval of a Proposition 2.5 override it requires a majority vote. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. The article fails. To what reason do you rise? Uh, Madam Moderator, I'd like to reconsider Article 26. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. We have Article 26 back before us. Uh, I'd like to uh, introduce an amendment to Article 26 um, to add 
a sum of money to avoid teacher layoffs. So you want to add the words to uh, a sum of money to avoid a sum of money of any $780,000 to avoid teacher layoffs? That's correct. We have a second. So the motion before you that now is on the floor is I move that the town vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $780,000 to avoid teacher layoffs contingent upon an approval of a proposition two and a half override. Can you do that? Can you, can you earmark it? Okay, to speak to the article, Mr. Pesevich. Well, very simply, uh, the way it was written in the uh, warrant uh, specifically stated it was money to avoid teacher layoffs. Um, and I'm just trying to make it um, so it reflects what it said in the warrant. Thank you. Thank you. On my left. Madam Moderator, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I uh, rise in support of the amendment um, for all of the reasons I've mentioned before. Um, but I think that w one of the things that we have to keep in mind is um, the level of expertise um, that it came to to uh, determine our budget allocations and these strategies. Um, there was an incredible amount of debate. Uh, we brought we uh, did an awful lot of reading. We did an awful lot of research, and uh, I think that we we have um, the right ingredients in place. What we need now is additional funding to make it work. Uh, I ask for your trust, uh, and I ask you to support this amendment. Thank you. On my right. Thank you. Well, it was made clear in the previous um, amendment that um, the school department could use it for anything, regardless of what it said. I would trust that if this passes, and if it passes at the ballot, that the school committee and the superintendent use this to um, avoid teacher layoffs and not however they want. Thank you. On my left. Madam Moderator, Irvin Russell, Precinct 6. And uh, I'd like, uh, I'm a little bit confused at this point. Uh, there's a, this motion is requesting that the Board of Selectmen take the issue up of bringing a ballot question forward for a two and a half override. Is that basically what? We, town meeting does not control whether this goes on the ballot. That only can happen to a decision, by a decision of the Board of Selectmen. The only action we are taking tonight is to vote and raise and appropriate $780,000 as a contingent motion that should the Board of Selectmen decide to put it on the ballot and it passes, then there will be money available to act on it. Now, is this the Pandora's box that once it's open, it can't be closed? I mean, I'm under the impression once we do override two and a half, that there is no resealing that that content or, or container, and uh, the the real, you know, action of the legislature that formed two and a half was in protection of all of us uh, at one point. Uh, An override does go on forever, yes, Mr. Russell. So, so they're basically, we would be one of the few communities within the Commonwealth of Massachusetts without a, a protection or, or two and a half levy uh, well, restriction. The, the town could come back and do an underwrite vote if they so chose. You could come back at a later, later time and do an underwrite vote. Thank you, Madam Mayor. On my left. Mike Flaherty, Precinct 1, um, through you to Attorney Bowen, where this article now differs very slightly from what's in the warrant. I just want to be sure that it accomplishes the same thing. Could you just confirm that, please? To answer the question. Madam Moderator, through you to the previous speaker. Uh, the language 
in this motion matches up more or less precisely with what's in the warrant. Thank you. That's all I needed to know. Selectman Bagley. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Um, I have a couple questions. One, a previous speaker had brought up the school committee can still do whatever they want with these funds. Uh, this is a permanent increase in your taxes. It will benefit the school department for one year, then it goes to the general fund. The subsequent years, so it's a permanent increase in your taxes. And my concern is this. This year it was an override. Last year it was a health care trust fund holiday. The year before that it was one-time stimulus funds. There seems to be, we, there's a pattern here. This is not going to fix the problem. And that's something that has to be looked at. No question in my mind. I've had discussions with members of the school committee and at length and discussed what needs to be done on the state level and possibly the federal level. But make no mistake, this is a permanent increase in your taxes because I don't see us ever voting in an underride. Never mind, I mean, it, it's, it's quite shocking that this town has entertained the idea of an override. But this is a permanent increase and the school committee does not have to designate these funds to avoid teacher layoffs. On my right, Rhonda Vugan, Precinct 6, also a member of the school committee. I'm in my first term, third year. I uh, have been part of the budget subcommittee for the last couple years and have been through uh, many meetings uh, dissecting and taking apart this budget. I stand uh, to ask you to support uh, this article. Um, just to remind everyone, what this article is doing is asking for it to be put on the ballot so then the voters of Wareham can decide on whether uh, we do uh, approve a Proposition 2 and F override. We have had two independent parties come in and talk about our school system. Uh, we just received a letter today uh, from a committee that read our NEASC report. And um, I'm hoping that through media that we're able to share more of the information there. But the majority, 80 percent of the recommendations that they're making have to do with the underfunding of our schools. I have a five-year-old in our school system. Um, he's in kindergarten at Hammond. Um, I've also spoken to teachers. I've also talked to them about some of the programs. I have agreed with the programs that have been put in place over the last year because I feel that they support teachers and they support our students, and they are the right things to do to increase scores in our school system and provide the right level of education. So again, I ask seconds. you to, uh, your elected body, the school committee, and ask you to support this article so that it can go to the ballot so the voters of Wareham can decide on whether uh, um, it is approved. Thank you. On my left. Stan Matthews, Precinct 4. Uh, I'm concerned that, uh, that it, we're voting now in relation to teacher layoffs, but once you do a two and a half override, I understand that that would be open season and in subsequent budgets, other programs would not be limited to two and a half because the two and a half would be gone. So it would be, uh, it would no longer just be teacher layoffs we'd be concerned with. It could be all kinds of different programs within the town. Mr. Heath. Madam Moderator, I rise in support of this particular amendment. This problem is not new. This problem goes back at least three years. We were helped by the state. We were helped by the federal government through the first two years. Last year, we decided to risk the health care fund of all the town employees to make up for a deficit. This year, we don't have any more places to go for one-time monies. We have to start to face reality. This money is needed to save Wareham school system. It's public school system. I'm a strong advocate of public school systems for one reason and one reason only, diversity and community. Compare that to the private schools where many children will be, you know, parents will feel forced to send their children for their education. What will you get there? Personal preference and exclusivity. Once again, I support this amendment. Thank you. On my right, Mr. McDonald. Madam Moderator, through you to the body. If you attended spring meeting 
spring town meeting last year, we voted at that time for a health care holiday. What that was was cost avoidance. We avoided the issue. We kicked it can down the road to this year. And as our chairman just stated, there's nowhere else to kick the can. Now this problem didn't happen overnight and we're not going to fix it tonight. All this does is authorize the treasurer to fund the override if and when it passes at the ballot box. And we ain't going to the ballot box tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, we've been on this for almost an hour. I'm hearing the same arguments over and over and over. Unless someone can come to the microphone with some new information, I am going to limit debate to the three people that I had standing, which was Mr. Flaherty, Mr. Sweat, and the gentleman on my left. Unless someone has new information that you can bring up, um, I am going to limit it because we're hearing the same arguments over and over. Uh, point of information. Am I done then? Oh, because I'm sorry. I had more I to say. And, I'm sorry. I, and, my and apologies. I, my apologies. That's okay. I apologize. I thought you. I thought you were finished. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a good thing I didn't write my speech down. I, mean, I, would, <laughs> I apologize, Mr. McDonald. Just a couple things because I'm just going to skip through the whole thing because I don't want to keep repeating everything. I think one of our members of the FinCom already mentioned that the most precious asset we have in the town is not our 56 miles of coastline, it's not our beaches, it's our children. Now, you consider the young women that sang the national anthem so beautifully, the young men that led us in the Pledge of Allegiance, the color guard that brought up the flags, and the young women of the tennis team, I believe, that did child care services the first two nights, they stepped up for us so we could be in here to make these kind of decisions. And I think we owe it to not just them, but the majority of the children in our school are willing to step up. We may have the future leaders of, of the state, of even the country. We may have a president in one of these classrooms. And I think we owe it to them to step up tonight and vote for this. Thank you. Thank you. If I just may remind you, um, I, at the beginning of our first night, asked if we only had two people in the aisle so that we don't block the aisleway, please. Um, on my right. Uh, thank you, Mike Flaherty. Um, just as a quick point of information, uh, when I got up here previously, I introduced myself as myself in Precinct 1. But in the interest of full disclosure, I am a member of the school committee. I should have mentioned that, uh, speaking for myself. Uh, I do support this amendment uh, wholeheartedly. Um, and thank you very much. On my left. Brian O'Boyle, Precinct 2. I would ask the Assembly to uh, vote against this. <clears throat> I know we need the money, but we're opening Pandora's box. We're going to the property owners again and again and again, and that well is starting to run dry. The town needs five to eight million dollars more per year, and we should be thinking outside the box instead of the property owner all the time. Even a suggestion of a one percent city or town sales tax where at least the tourists and the summer people would pay 30 to 40 percent of that increase and give us $8 million a year so we can fix our buildings and pay our teachers and pay our police. Thank you. On my right. Jeff Sweat, Commissioner Road, <clears throat> District 1. Uh, two quick points. One is a previous speaker talked about permanent solutions. This is the first permanent action that we will take that will, on an annual basis, increase the available funds to support the schools. Secondly, there is a fundamental problem with the um, funding of schools, not only within Wareham, but in the state. I can tell you that I am running for a statewide office at the, with the Association of School Committees to, in fact, address that very issue. I, I frankly believe that the funding of, of um, schools through property taxes is, is flawed, and it's my goal to change that. I'm, I'm, I'm going to end debate on this because we've, we've spent an hour, we've heard the same arguments. Um, point of order, Madam Moderator. State your point. You said that we could speak if we had new information. Do you have something new to add? I believe I do. I will be the judge of whether or not you have something new. If it's not new, then I will cut off all debate. You may go. Uh, Ken Levitt, Precinct 1. I just wanted to say that some of the 
members here were under the impression that if this passes there is no more proposition two and a half in existence the fact is that if this passes it just raises the base but any further raises beyond that are still covered under proposition two and a half thank you thank you i'm going to end debate um, we've spent enough time on this i am going to call for a vote on article 26. we're voting on what's before you on the main, it's a main motion, I'm sorry. I move that the town vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $780,000 to avoid teacher layoffs contingent upon an approval of a proposition to an app override. This requires a majority vote. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. It passes by a majority. Madam Clerk. Point of, point of information. I believe that one of the members of the body made an amendment. Right. So we should be voting on the amendment before we vote on the main motion. I believe that is the case. Mm -hmm. It was a reconsideration mm -hmm. and it became a main motion. No, it was reconsideration and then a Under reconsideration, it became a main motion, and I have advice of counsel to that. Please pull the next number. Eighteen. Oh, here we go. I have a motion. Madam Moderator. I move that $360,000 is appropriated for funding the purchase of new school buses, including the payment of all costs incidental or related thereto, that to meet this appropriation, the treasurer, with the approval of the Board of Selectmen, is authorized to borrow $360,000 under General Law, Chapter 44, Section 7-9, or any other enabling authority, that the Board of Selectmen is authorized to contract for and expend any federal or state aid available for the project, and that the Board of Selectmen is authorized to take any other action necessary or convenient to carry out this project, provided, however, that this vote shall not take effect until the town votes to exempt from the limitation on total taxes imposed by General Law, Chapter 59, Section 21C, Proposition 2.5, amounts required to pay the principal of an interest on the borrowing authorized by this vote. Do I have a second? To speak to the article, please? Am I right? Madam Moderator, just to be clear, how many minutes do I have? You have five as a proponent. Thank you. Um, I hope to be able to do it less than that. Um, I have asked uh, Matt to put up two slides. The first slide shows the current mileage on the fleet. Um, which, you'll, which you can see has um, shifted somewhat. We now actually uh, spend uh, more miles on sped vehicles than we do on regular vehicles. We've reduced some runs. That has caused it to stabilize on the regular vehicles. Um, and you can also see that the reason for the increased sped miles has to do with homeless children under the McKenney-Vinto regulations. Um, I'll be glad to go back to that slide if anybody has any questions, but I have limited time. If you go to the next slide, and I apologize, there's n it may not be all that clear, but to show the entire fleet, uh, that's what it takes. Um, and the part in, in, call it orange or gold or whatever, are the um, buses that are uh, 12 years or older, and the part that are green are less than 12 years. Um, okay, some quick points about this. One is the issue of privatization. Should be privatized or not? The, the, um, my hope was in studying this almost ad nauseum, but in very serious nature um, over the last six months, was that I would come to the conclusion that we could privatize and get on with the business of educating our children because, frankly, privatization or, or staying a, as a town department had no particular passion or interest to me. I just want to get the kids safely to school and cost-effectively to school. Unfortunately, my analysis was that because of the unique nature in which we run the school's uh, transportation department and because of the very low capital investment, 
outside of the buses, the physical plant, it is simply not possible to privatize and spend less money. Now, you don't really have to take my word for it, but you might ask, what's my incentive to lie to you? You know, I'm going to pay your taxes, my taxes to you, uh, just like anybody else. I can tell you my background was I have spent tens of millions of dollars buying businesses in my lifetime. And I can tell you there are sometimes maybe one out of 20, maybe two out of 20, where I simply have been unable to buy a business because they simply ran it so uniquely that my model says it was only worth this much and their model says it was worth more. I have friends, maybe even in this room, who say, you can't be right. I have been called many things in my lifetime. Stupid isn't one of them. And I guarantee you, I have looked at this and it simply doesn't save us any money to privatize. In fact, it would cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars more to privatize. If you believe me, thank you. If you don't, prove me wrong. Second issue, how do we run this thing in a way that costs you as little money as possible and still have the safety of our kids um, in mind? And the answer is, we have to have a reasonably aged fleet. Right now, we don't. So we're coming to you to replace four to five vehicles, some of them big buses, some of them sped buses, some of them vans, something that will gradually get us to a reasonably aged fleet. Now, candidly, I would prefer to do this without a debt exclusion, but it's a start. And the reason we have to do it this way is because the way I'd like to do it in future years is not available to us. So this will give us four to five vehicles, we don't know exactly how we'll use them because it will depend on the specific uh, recommendations from the superintendent and the transportation manager. But the bottom line is this will give us a start. In future years, I hope not to have to come back to you with another debt exclusion to do this. How? Well, the House Ways and, Committee, uh, House Ways and Means Committee actually fully funded McKinney-Vento, which means... One minute which means over 100000 perhaps as much as one hundred and twenty dollars or $130,000 annually to the town of Wareham to support all the homeless children that we, that we take back to their homes. That plus approximately half of the meals tax, and you will recall that when we passed that meals tax, that was supposed to go to the school department to help the capital investment, specifically the buses. And then, and this has not been debated by the school committee yet, that in combination with a small fee will, the combination of those three pieces will give us the $360,000 on an annual basis so we do not need to come back to you for another debt exclusion for more buses. I, I urge you to support this. It's a, it's a critical start to improve the, uh, the fleet that we have. And the alternatives are terrible. First of all, the fees, it's Ten like seconds. anything else. The more you charge, the less you're going to have people pay the fee. We think we may be able to generate about 60000 but remember, half of our kids don't have to pay this fee because they're low-income, free, and reduced kids. Time. We, I would request one more minute. Mr. Sweat requests one more minute. I'll put it before the body. All those in favor of giving Mr. Sweat one more minute, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. You have one more minute. Thank you very much. So we could charge higher fees, but I'm not convinced we'd get more money. It's like taxes. The more you charge, the more people evade them. We could also reduce service. Legally, we have to provide services K through 6. We could eliminate 7 through 12. I can assure you several things would happen. One is some kids wouldn't get to school. Secondly, the traffic around Viking Drive would be horrendous. And thirdly, and statistically, this is absolutely guaranteed, there would be some accidents associated with those kids trying to get to school on walking, riding bikes, Ten going seconds. to cars, et cetera. So I urge you to support this as the start to replace our aging fleet. Thank you very much. May I have the vote of the Board of Selectmen? Yes, you may, Madam Moderator. The Board of Selectmen voted favorable action, zero in favor, three opposed, and zero abstain. Thank you. May I have the vote and recommendation of the Finance Committee? The vote of the Finance Committee was for favorable action, five in the affirmative, one negative, one abstention. Thank you. To speak to the article, Selectman Bagley. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Um, I happen to be one of the members of the Transportation Action Committee, and we have not met in some weeks. I had hoped to meet prior to town meeting, but unfortunately that never happened. Uh, there were many discussions. 
And one of the things that we discussed was um, something that uh, Mr. Sweat mentioned, or the previous speaker, I, I beg your pardon. And he talked about some of the issues that we brought up. Now, we had decided um, or had discussed in the committee to look at what we referred to as Plan B. And that was fee-for-service, decreasing services, tearing service because they would use 13 fewer buses, fewer drivers, and many, many schools have children that are transported by their parents with very similar situations with um, driveways. I've been by some of the elementary schools, and there's a line of parents, and I don't recall too many accidents down over there. So um, after Plan B was discussed, because we also discussed, let's call the debt exclusion what it really is, an override, because they're going to have to keep coming back for buses, because it wasn't identified to the Transportation Action Committee whatsoever that there were alternative funding. Um, so every year, they'd be coming back for money for the buses. We decided, that as a Transportation Action Committee, to table, not just simply dismiss privatization. And at, at, we're in the process of getting information from surrounding towns seconds. to see um, how much it costs. Do they privatize? Do they have their own? I don't know if this body realizes it, but there are, I think, three at this point um, school districts in the Commonwealth that do their own transportation. And I also want to point out that this says vehicles. It doesn't say buses. So we are not getting like five brand new Time. buses. Please vote against this article. Mrs. Bronk. Wow. This is the Mrs. first Bronk. I know, I know. Bronk. Safety, safety. I'm talking about safety. Okay. The children's safety of Wareham we're talking about, okay? That's what I'm talking about. Um, somebody did a study and, 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 and had this big move against the school, our, the condition of our school buses. They were appalling. We need to do something. Our children aren't riding on safe buses. So they formed a committee. Mm -hmm. And... It's Ladies no longer a safety issue. It's no longer a safety issue. Look at the age of the fleet. Come on, folks. Think with our heads. See what's going on here. Please, please, I urge you to vote for this article. Am I right? Hi, Michelle Langford, um, District 4. I just have a question regarding this five years thing. Uh, Previously, it was stated if we vote for Proposition Two and a Half override, it's like forever until we die or after then. So my question is, um, and all of these override items, will they appear separately on the ballot when we go to vote, or is it all going to be lumped into one big thing? They will appear on the ballot separately. Okay, and what about the five-year term for this particular article? I believe that the borrowing will be for a five-year note. Is that correct? That's a five-year note. Okay, so this particular two and a half override will be separate on the ballot, and it will have a limitation of five years. Correct. Okay. Am I right? I don't know. Does the town attorney? It's a debt exclusion. It's a debt exclusion, not an override. So it's a debt exclusion is only for this purpose and for the for a five-year borrowing okay thank you am i right thank you madam moderator to uh, the point of a previous speaker um there were concerns there were concerns with the buses when the registry pulled 17 of them or 18 of them off the road you're absolutely right there were concerns there still are concerns and a transportation committee was um, created. I was on it until it was unilaterally dissolved. The um, opinions, the, uh, the decision to dissolve that was that they were, uh, the school department went out for an RFP. That RFP... Mrs. Ekstrom, if you could stick to the article, which is... Okay. With regards to... It's fine. I'm, I'm sure this will pass, but I, I, I would like to ask 
or to uh, um, request that um, the chairman of the school committee address the issue that he addressed with the Minot families at a, at a meeting that I, I did attend um, when he had said that this is going to be, I think it was four buses, it's five years, but as um, the selectman said, this will probably be an annual thing so that they can address the buses. I think that's what it was. And once the five years is up, we'll have another five, or next year we'll have another f um, four buses. The next year we'll have another four. And then when the first one's off, we're going to go back to that. So this override is for this year. My understanding is their anticipation is to do it again. I'm sorry, debt exclusion. Debt exclusion is this year. That will run five years. Next year, there'll be another one for four more buses, which seconds. will run five years. And it will continue like that on. That was my understanding at the Minot meeting. To answer the question only. Since the Minot meeting, we have found out that the House Ways and Committee fully funded McKinney-Vento legislation. Now, why do we have some confidence that this $120,000, $130,000 will annually be coming to us? Because the entire funding for the whole state is about less than $12 million on a budget of, call it, $30 billion. So it's an incredibly small amount. It has received the recommendation of the House Ways and, Committee, Ways and Means Committee, and it just happens to disproportionately benefit Wareham. So that's new information since I spoke to the minor parents, and I'm happy to be able to tell you about it. On my left. Madam Moderator, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you know, I, I think at this point in time, um, this is my fourth term on the school committee, Cliff Sylvia, uh, Precinct 1. This is my fourth term on the school committee, and we haven't been studying uh, the bus situation for quite as long as I've been on the school committee, but almost. And uh, I think that um, we have studied it, we've had independent uh, committees, we have had surveys, we have had uh, consultants, and we now have a, another committee ongoing. Bottom line is that we can study this uh, to death. The bottom line is we have vehicles, we have vehicles that are old, we have vehicles that are, uh, are being repaired almost on a daily basis. We have to update the fleet. Now, even with updating the fleet, um, we have been uh, reasonably sure that uh, it's still going to come out below private funding. And it doesn't matter whether we private fund it or, or have our own fleet. Right now, we have our own fleet and we have our own system. The bottom line is, and reasonable people would contend, that you have to replace your vehicles at some point in time. So what this does, just to clarify any misinformation, is it is a one-time debt exclusion to be paid over five years. Thank you, Ms. Madam Moderator. Please support this article. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. On my left. Uh, Frank D. Felice, 53 Mackey Way. I'm up here in support of the article, too. And the reason being is we have a police force, and don't they get their cars and they run 100,000 and you have to replace them? This is no different than the police force having safety with them. The, the school buses need safety, too. They run and they wear down. They have to be changed. We just can't keep, we can give it to them anytime they want, which I don't have a problem with. Believe me, I don't want a ticket, I said. But <laughs> why not give it to the school? I, I, I say we move the article. Can I do I'm, that? I'm sorry, we can't accept a motion to move it after a speech. On my right. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Jane Donahue, Precinct 3. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd just like to say two things. Yes, in fact, we have been discussing this until the cows come home. Buses and education. Perhaps if we would stop quarreling about the buses, privatize, because we know that gas is going to keep going up, people. This analysis, and I know Ms. the previous speaker, Chairman of the School Committee, is a, is a very smart man. But how smart is it if nobody else is doing it, number one? And number two, I think we, if we could get out of the bus business and focus our, our attention on educating the children, we wouldn't have so many problems. Thank you. On my left. Madam Moderator, Mike Flaherty. Uh, I move the question. Thank you. We have a motion before us to move the question. Um, Madam, I'm standing um, If we him. have a motion before us to move the question, I have a second. It's not debatable. All those, it requires a two-thirds vote. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. The motion carries.
We point now order, ma'am. I was standing State before point. him. I'm sorry, but the, the motion was made before I recognized you, so his takes priority. The motion before you now is on Article 18. As it comes before you on the screen, that $360,000 is appropriated for funding the purchase of new school buses, and it reads as it is before you. This is a borrowing article, and therefore it does require a two-thirds vote. I am going to try for a voice vote. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. Passes by a two-thirds majority. Madam Clark. Article 8. May I have a motion, please? Madam Moderator, I move that the town vote to raise and appropriate $150,000 in no sense to the stabilization fund. Thank you. Do I have a second? To speak to the article? Madam Moderator, uh, is the town administrator speaking to it, or should I? Okay, stabilization. <laughs> we need to continue to increase our stabilization fund because we're going to be going out and looking for borrowing. One of the things that's most critical is our credit rating, and one of the things that's looked at very closely is our commitment to be able to make payments when they become due. Needless to say, based on our current budget, one, our stabilization will get a very close look, and our commitment to ensuring that we can guarantee our payments on an early basis is going to get a very close look. We started rebuilding this fund. At one point it was 1.3, we spent it to zero, and then we started building it basically three years ago. Uh, and we are building it again this year because we are facing a large amount of borrowing. Thank you. Thank you. May I have the vote of the Board of Selectmen? Madam Moderator, the Board of Selectmen voted favorable action. Three in favor, zero opposed, and zero abstained. Thank you. May I have the vote and recommendation of the Finance Committee? Madam, Chair, uh, Madam Moderator, the Finance Committee voted favorable action, eight in the affirmative, no negatives, no abstentions. Thank you. To speak to the article on my right. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Jane Donahue, Precinct 3. I fully understand and am aware of the importance of the stabilization fund. We have been trying to build it up, and I understand that it is important if we intend to borrow, and maybe we will borrow and maybe we won't. But last night, the discussion on the, on the town's budget centered around possibility of having to close town hall on Fridays. And going back to all of the employees at town hall and renegotiating their contracts and making them come to work on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday for additional hours. This would not only cause an inconvenience to the public, but it could be a great hardship on a number of employees. I was also told last night that closing the town hall on Friday would only, call, would, would only save us $40,000. Therefore, would like to make an amendment to reduce the amount of money to $110,000 and the $40,000 be put into the Municipal Buildings Fund to keep the town hall open. Second. Do you have that in writing? I will. I will in just a minute, Madam Moderator. Thank you.
I, I wanted to seek advice for counsel. Mrs. Donahue, with your amendment, the only thing that you can do under this article is to reduce from 150 to 110 thousand dollars to allocate it to another line item we would have to go back and reconsider the budget and take that up separately so would you like to maintain your motion to reduce madam moderator for for clarification it's my understanding that the stabilization fund is a line in the budget already it has to be a line in the budget. Where else would the revenue come from? Last night I was told it was not a line in the budget, but it has to be. So I don't understand why we would have to go back and it's do a that. Separate, it is a separate article. It's not, it's not voted into the budget. It, it shows in the budget as a separate article. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I would still like to reduce it to 110000 and then I will ask the indulgence of the body for a quick motion to put the money back into the municipal maintenance account. Again, I like like you to think about the other people in town, all of our summer families who come down here who don't know what's going on, who don't know what we're voting on, they pay taxes too. They come down on Thursday night, they expect to take care of their business on Friday, and boom, they're not going to be able to do that. So I, I think that we should consider this reduction and the subsequent increase. Thank you. To speak to the amendment on my left. Uh, Mike Flaherty. Um, thank you, Madam Moderator. Um, it was refreshing to hear the, um, that both the, the selectmen and the Finance Committee voted favorable action, I believe with no, um, no dissent. Um, I, 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 put, I put my trust in that. It's very rare that that happens. So uh, I urge you to uh, vote down the amendment and vote, the original article, vote favorable action on the original article. Thank you. Selectman Winslow. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Through you to the body. I think it's important to understand the true financial impact on the community by reducing our contribution to the stabilization fund. Due to the town's unstable financial history, our current standing with the Department of Revenue, it's not prudent to reduce our contribution to the stabilization fund at this point. Despite the fact that this is presented as simply a reduction in the amount that we're going to transfer into the stabilization fund, it has the same effect as using the stabilization fund as a source of one-time revenue to balance the budget. This amendment would be at the expense of the town's overall fiscal health. It could impact our ability to borrow at competitive interest rates and be financially detrimental to the community as a whole. Nobody wants to close Town Hall on Friday. Nobody wants people laid off. These aren't decisions that were reached easily. And I'd like the body to understand that, Madam Moderator, that the people who worked on this budget made very difficult decisions because this is what we need to do. And I ask you to support the decisions that were made Thank you. On my right, Mr. Heath. Madam Moderator, I'd like to read from the minutes of the meeting of the Board of Selectmen on March 15, 2011, under the chairmanship of um, uh, Jane Donahue, uh, and also uh, uh, selectmen at that time were Walter Cruz, Brenda Ekstrom, Stephen Holmes, and Karen Winslow. These minutes were approved uh, on 9 6, 2011. Item that came up and was voted on, draft final policy, stabilization fund. The board discussed what percentage should be placed in the stabilization fund. Motion, selection, selectman extra moved to accept policy 11-01. The board of selectmen and the finance committee must agree on an amount to be considered to be placed in the stabilization fund to be no less than 3% of the estimated local receipts. The town administrator will review, analyze, and determine that the estimated allocation will not interfere with the operations of the town. Selectman Holmes seconded. The vote was 4-0-0. Zero, zero. The estimated local receipts and reimbursements for this year are 4832000 
3% of that number is $144,000. So when the town administrator came to us and recommended $150,000, we agreed with them. Thank you. On my right. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that the minutes of the meeting that were just read only served to emphasize the fact that I do understand that we need stabilization fund. I do understand that it is good for our financial health. I do understand the importance of it. The minutes also said, if you were listening carefully, that we were also looking not to impact the, the um, service aspect of the town if we could avoid it. And I think that working to try to keep the town hall open for $40,000 is a balance when you're looking at the stability and the health of the community. So again, I just want to say that this minutes of the meeting and the policy that was set while I was chairman of the board is a good policy. And I do think that we should adhere to it whenever we possibly can. But this is definitely hard times call for hard measures. And again, if it were you and they were asking you, all of a sudden you have to work Wednesday, Tuesday, Monday, and, and, and take off Friday, and what about your daycare arrangements? It's just really unfair to the other employees. You're here tonight because you want, to, you want to look at the school department employees, a lot of you, and I think we should have the same consideration for not only our town employees, but for the people who enjoy the services of town hall on Fridays. Thank you. On my right, Mr. McDonald. I'd like to move the question. I have a motion before us to move the question. We call as a two-thirds vote. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed? It is passed. The vote now will come on the amendment um, to raise and appropriate um, $110,000 to the stabilization fund. This does require a two-thirds vote. All those the point, point of um, order or information, we're voting on the amendment, correct? We're not voting on the main article, That's we're voting correct. on the amendment. My, let me just check with council. My understanding is because it's going into the stabilization fund, it requires a two-thirds vote. Okay, I will rescind that. It, um, to act on the amendment would only require a majority. So the vote will now come on the amendment. All those in favor, please say aye. Point of order, before you call it, could we please have it change? You, you say that we're voting on what's on the screen, and I think that's what the Finance Committee member was saying, because it's supposed to be 110. Right, we're voting on the amendment, on the amendment that's before us, for $110,000, not the original motion. The amendment is to reduce it by $40,000. So we're voting on the amendment to reduce it by $40,000 to put $110,000 into the stabilization fund. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed? No. The amendment fails. The vote now will come on the main motion, which is to raise and appropriate $150,000 in no cents to the stabilization fund. This does require a two-thirds vote. I will try for a voice vote. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? It passes by a two-thirds vote. Article 35. May I have a motion? Um, the Madam motion. Moderator, Article 35, I move to appropriate, I'm sorry, I move to approve this article as printed in the warrant. Oh, right. Thank you. May I have a second? To speak to the article on my right? Uh, 
Madam Moderator, um, I've tried to make this as short as possible, but I will need more than five minutes. How much more time do you think you would need? I would probably need almost 10 minutes altogether. Why don't you take your five minutes and then we'll see where you're at and then I will poll the body. Okay, thank you. Um, Matt's getting our presentation. Uh, I'm Priscilla Porter. I'm a member of the Friends of the William Free Library. Um, and I'd like to explain the Spinney Memorial Library, uh, how it will be an asset to the community. Uh, next slide. Um, one library, two locations. Spinney will be a branch of the William Free Library. A branch library is an extension of the main library, a branch service specific areas of the community to give the residents easy access to the services provided by the main library. SPIDI will serve all citizens, but specifically bring library services to the adults and children of Onset Village and East Wareham. At a time when we are talking about decreasing services in town, the Friends of the Wareham Free Library wants to increase those services to our citizens through this gift to Wareham. Next. Spinney adds value to our town. The Friends are offering the town a new building that will need no repairs for years to come. This includes both the new addition and a totally renovated historical building. The renovation of this 100-year building, which used to house the Spinney Memorial Library in the past, adds to the charm and attraction of the village. This will be the first municipal community center in Onset. It is handicapped accessible, Spinney can be used for a meeting space for the general public, town boards and committees, and would be available to town departments. Spinney is currently assessed at $581,000 and appraised at $360,000. $30,000 inventory. When the town accepts Spinney, it will receive the contents of the building. This includes computers, printers, facts, and copy machines, in addition to furniture, cleaning equipment, etc. In addition, the Friends will spend $25,000 from a restricted donation for new books and materials, which will be purchased by the town's professional library staff. Educational support. Recent studies have demonstrated that schools with libraries have children with higher levels of literacy than schools without. Our elementary schools, including the Hammond School in Onset, have no functioning libraries. The branch will offer story times, after-school homework support, and availability of reading materials for our children throughout the entire year. In addition, the library's adult literacy program, Reading Partners, will bring tutoring help for GED and general literacy skills for adults. Spinney also adds value to our library system. The total Wayham Free Library hours are increased by 624 per year. In order for the library system to be certified without a waiver, we need to meet our 50 hour per, hour, 50 hour per week requirement. This is derived from a total number of hours, and Spinney would add on 624 to the main library's total each year, which meets the board, the Mass Board of Library Commissioners' requirements. Our state aid to our library system will be increased by $4,608 annually, helping to defray operating costs. Many of our citizens cannot afford computers or internet fees. The computer use at the main library is consistently high and by providing more computers and access to the internet at Spinney, we will be providing an important service to those citizens, whether full-time or summer residents. The main library regularly schedules both adult and children program on a variety of topics. The summer reading program for children will be extended to Spinney so that onset children can walk to the special events and story times 
adults who have difficulty getting to the main library for programs will have a convenient access to programming at Spinney. Next. 30 seconds. Um, the Friends are offering this wonderful asset to the town at no cost for two years. This would take us up to fiscal year 2015. Um, and we would absorb all the operating uh, costs. Um, next slide. These are some pictures of the inside of the building. Um, you can see the children's area, the main desk. It has a full storage basement. This is the lower picture to my right is um, the meeting room, the original building, which has been restored. Your time. You um, I have more, but it's up to the body. How much time would you like to ask the body to allow? Uh, well, I can skip some of this and just kind of go into the figures, maybe about three more minutes. Mrs. Porter would like to have three more minutes. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. You have your three minutes. OK, we'll do the minute. Uh, the, dollar figures. Um, startup fees for Spinney are $29,440. This includes the $25,000 for new books. Uh, it is to bring in the sales system, um, bring in the software needed for the staff computer, which is at the main desk, to be brought in. Um, and then the annual cost of $39,248 per year is for a part-time staff person, um, professional staff library person, um, custodial care, the uh, utilities, sewer, water, all of the things that go with running it. The friends are prepared to pay the total of $107,936 which would be for two years. Um, I got information today. We had applied for a grant. Um, and we have gotten a grant, which is going to add $5,900 that we can put towards operating costs, which would take us into the third year, because we plan and hope to be able to fully fund it through a third year. I guess the next one, whatever. <laughs> Um, so we, we really, we would like your support. We would really like to have this building be a branch library from the beginning when the building was given to us. That was the intent, that we would restore the original building, put on an addition, and it would become a branch. Um, I was a previous trustee, um, been involved with the Friends for many years, and it has been a request from various areas of town they would like to have a branch. Um, I would like to think Onset is the start. You have one minute. I would appreciate your support, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. May I have the vote of the Board of Selectmen? Madam Moderator, the Board of Selectmen voted favorable action, two in favor, one opposed, with zero abstentions. May I have the vote and recommendation of the Finance Committee? Madam Moderator, the Finance Committee voted favorable action, three in the affirmative, four in the negative, and zero abstentions. The recommendation of the Finance Committee is that it does not recommend favorable action on this article. Finance Committee members voting against acceptance were deeply concerned about accepting the Spinney Library, considering the town's finances, which may not be adequate to continue and operate the library at the end of the first two years. Thank you. Madam Moderator, we request a minority opinion, please. I'm sorry? We, ha we have a minority recommendation a minor report. We have a minority report. Well. Okay. Minority report, please. The acceptance of this property located at 259 Onset Avenue 
represents an opportunity. The Friends of the Wareham Free Library will cover operating expenses for two years in an effort to eliminate costs during our current financial issues. In addition to elimination of two years of operating expenses, the additional hours provided by Spinney will increase funding from the state. Beyond the physical issues, there is a deep socioeconomic positive. Patrons that once traveled from onset to West Wareham will now have access to the same services. Hammond School, located in onset, will be able to utilize Spinney for reading and similar programs. Spinney provides a perfect place for civic groups to meet. Thank you. Is there anything to be said on Article 35? No. On my right, I believe the woman, the third woman was coming down first. Uh, yes, Oops, sorry. Uh, Amy and if Goodwin. we could only have two at the microphone at one time, please. Uh, my name is Amy Goodwin, Onset Precinct 2. Uh, my only concern is uh, that um, the article be posted as written in the warrant. Um, I noticed that was a problem earlier. I'm the uh, Wareham Girl Scout Service Unit Coordinator and part of the agreement um, for the Friends of Wareham to send this over to the library. My understanding is that Girl Scouts would still be allowed to use the building for meetings. So my concern was that if it's not in the warrant written up for us to vote on as written, um, that that would not happen. To answer the question, I only bring it up because before we just went through that it wasn't written correctly and we voted on it and we had to redo it. I am for the library uh, taking Spinney. Um, I think it's very good for the community. Um, my point of interest is we have 16 Girl Scout troops in Wareham. We're growing by three or four troops a year. Building space is very limited. They've graciously allowed us to start to use their building this year. Uh, starting in September, and that's just my only concern is to make sure that um, we understand that the article is voted on as written in the warrant. That's my only concern. Right. Uh, Mrs. Goodwin, and that's what it is before us is uh, to approve the article as printed in the warrant, which would mean that the town would allow the Girl Scout troops because that is printed in the warrant. Thank you very much. Gentleman on my left. Brian O'Boyle, printing two. I would ask the assembly to vote this down. Um, we can't afford to repair our, our own library right. as it stands now. We can't afford to fully staff it. And in three years, this 30,000 operating budget is gonna be $40,000. So I would ask, we can't afford our own. We shouldn't be taking on another uh, uh, liability. On my right. Uh, Tisha Weir, District 5. Um, I have a question about uh, the initial person was talking uh, about a grant um, that the 12 hours that Spinney would be open uh, would allow to happen. Would not increasing the hours at the current library accomplish the same goal? To answer the question, Mr. McDonald. Through you to the speaker. If you operated the same hours at the main library because of the way it's set up, the, the money that you would be getting from the state would be more than offset by the expenses at the main library. Because it's operated as it's being funded by the, the friends for two years, it's not costing us anything. So any money we get from the state is coming to us with no offset, no expenses. So it is money or additional money to the library system, I guess you would call it at that point. But there, if you did it at the main library, it would cost you an arm and a leg to do the same thing for those 12 hours. Does that help? I think so. So what you're saying is um, the reason that it's not costing additional funds is because of the two years that the friends are intending to fund it. Correct. Okay, my next question would be, what happens on year three or year four? Well, I think at that point- uh, Mr. McDonald, to, someone to answer the question, Mrs. Porter? To answer the question. Okay. What happens on year three or four? Okay, 
on year three, the friends are hoping to fund all of it, or at least most of it, but can I answer the question about the difference between the hours at the main library and at Spinney? Well, the question before us is the one that she had, um, mm -hmm. if, just to answer her question. Um, I'm, I'm a little Madam nervous Moderator. about what happens. Um, as the previous speaker had said, um, in year three and four, and I just Would you like to repeat your question, and then we could ask Mrs. Oh, sure, I'll repeat the question. Okay, and then we um, could ask Mrs. Porter to answer it. Would not increasing the hours at the main library accomplish the same goal to getting the grant as increasing or adding hours to the Spinney Library? To answer the question. Okay. The cost to open the main library um, far exceeds what it costs to operate the Spinney Library. Um, Madam Moderator, um, the library director is here. Um, she put the budget together. Perhaps she could answer these questions. If she cares to answer the question. To answer the question. Uh, Denise Medeiros, library director. To answer the question, um, to open the library at the main library an extra 12 hours, I had estimated probably at least four times as much as what it would cost to operate Spinney. You have to understand that the Spinney library is 1,900 square feet. The main library is 22,000 square feet. We like to have at least three staff members on. Ideally, we should have four. Sometimes we actually have two. But yeah, that's the reasoning behind that. Thank you. Yep. Did that answer your question, Mrs. Weir? It does, thank you. Thank you. Madam Moderator, to answer the second part of her question, what happens in years three and four, eventually this converts over totally to the town, and the town is responsible to fund the entire thing, including the repairs of the building, et cetera. One of the things that- Just to are, answer the question. Yes, no, to answer the question, all right. They're estimating that there would be no maintenance costs in the first two years. That's not a guarantee. On my right, Adam. Mrs. Donahue was standing for us. Mrs. Donahue. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Through you to, to Council, I'm looking at the article as printed in the warrant, and I see no mention of money from the Friends of the Wayham Free Library. Where does that, where does, how does this article guarantee us the funds that come from the Wareham, the Friends of the Wayham Free Library? That's my first question. To answer the question. Uh, Madam Moderator, through you to the previous speaker, uh, there is no money in this. So any uh, representations as to uh, further subsidy or donation of funds or just simply that promises that are being made here tonight. They're not part of the article. Thank you. That's what I expected you to say, Mr. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Bowen. Um, is there some way that we can amend this article to include those monetary donations as a guarantee to the public? I would say that was outside the scope because that the public has not been forewarned um, that that would happen. I would I would rule that outside the scope. the The issue before us is a conveyance of the building. It doesn't specifically get into what would happen after. The article that was posted was simply a conveyance. Thank you, Madam Moderator. In light of that information, I think that we should think even further before we accept this building. If we have no real in-writing assurances, aside from the conveyance of a building to the town, there are two criteria that give us money from the state for the library. One is the number of hours that the library is open, and the second is how much money we put into the budget for the library. I'm famil very familiar with this, painfully familiar with this. We are operating under a waiver now from the state because of our budgetary restrictions on our current library. And if we were to open this library and have to operate it down the road, I would ask Mr. Sullivan if he could give us some sort of an idea of what this might do to the town's library budget. 
to answer the question. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, it, it would it would tax the library's budget. It, it would further increase it. And uh, right now, on our five-year projection, we know that we're projecting deficits into the future. So. I, I would say, I, as of right now, I couldn't tell you whether we would have the money to fund that. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. I think there's nobody in this room who wouldn't agree that it would be really nice to have a second library. Um, we, 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 we're not even going to, we, we can go to the library on Fridays when town hall is closed, I guess, but I, I just Mrs. don't Donahue. see the illogical. This is Donahue, and ladies and Madam gentlemen, moderator, please. I'm simply pointing out the, that there's illogical decision-making going on here. On the one hand, we're closing our town hall. On the other hand, we're buying a seconds. library. We're accepting a library that we may have to close in two years with no guarantees in this article. That, and I'm, not that I'm saying that the Friends of the William Free Library won't come, come through, but there is, there's nothing that guarantees that it has to happen that way. And the Wareham Public Library Time. needs... Thank you, Madam Moderator. I'd like 30 seconds more, if I might. I would put the vote before the body to give Mrs. Donahue another 30 seconds. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. I'm sorry, the body has ruled against you. On my left. Madam Moderator Irvin Russell, Precinct 6. And uh, initially I stood up in complete favor of this transaction because it seemed like a positive, uh, you know, move uh, on the part with especially with the diligence uh, on the part of the, the friends uh, getting three years of unencumbered costs. Uh, and and I'm, I have the tendency and, and an optimism that we would be in, in a financial position to accept such a, a good gift uh, in the near future. Uh, the the five-year projection, you know, I, I'm sorry it's so dismal, but uh, I envision this community as developing and, and expanding and a lot more resources being available in the near future. That's just my optimism, but it, I think it will be fruition. And, and I think that this will be a nice addition to the town's uh, services that it provides to its, its residents, its children, and everybody else. I, I would ask for voting in favor of this acceptance. Thank you. On my right, Mrs. Bronk. For you, Madam Moderator, um, I applaud, I personally applaud everything that the Friends have done, past, present, and I know they will continue to do in the future because they're a bunch of dedicated individuals. However, ladies and gentlemen, the real reality of it is our library here, we can't even afford to fix what needs to be fixed. I think it's a wonderful idea to have a, a second library in, in, in Onset. I'd like to see one up in Shangalara. I'd like to see one in West Wareham. Everyone would love to see this. But this is, this is not reality, ladies and gentlemen. We can, what's going to happen if we take over this library at this point in time, we're going to end up having to shut it down. We can't tax our current library any further. They've been completely destroyed. Ladies and gentlemen, vote with your head, not your heart, because I had to, and, and, and unfortunately, it's just not the right thing to do at this point in time. Thank you. On my right. Thank you, Madam Moderator. I just had a couple of questions. I actually asked uh, Mrs. Porter to stay down. Um, one question was that um, what happens um, with the building if we can't afford it? whether it's two years, three years, five years down the line. Um, I know that they're going to pay for it. Or the, you know, I'm sure there'll be a memorandum of agreement with the town that they'll pay for it for the first couple of years. But um, my understanding is in the, um, I think in the deed, in the agreement, it says for use as a public library. And the finance committee member, uh, the previous speaker, made an excellent point. What happens? Um, if we can't afford it, we're going to watch this beautiful building go into disrepair or we're on the hook for it. That's question number one. And question number two is um, one of the first speakers talked about the Girl Scouts. I have daughters that are in the Girl Scouts. I had one that actually was in this building when there were the holes in the floor. Um, 
but my concern is is that if we're opening it only 12 hours a week and we're allowing the Girl Scouts to use it, and the way the article reads, it says, and other nonprofit organizations. Um, the town could face some situations as far as um, are we going to be discriminatory that we let one group in rather than another group? Um, is, oh. 30 seconds. If we have issues with that, um, and we also have, um, you know, at if they're going to pay for the operating hours of 12 hours, what happens um, if the people are using it? It is a reasonable time after school or things. If they want to use it seven days a week, who's paying for that? Those additional heat, heat and light, and all of those other issues. I'm not against it. I mean, I think I'm the only one in this town, um, in in this for the t side of the town that signed the contract. I think it's a good idea. Mrs. Ekstrom, your time is up. Did you want... Those, those are my two questions. Two questions to answer the question. Okay. Um, okay. What I can tell you about the building, it is restricted. That's part of getting the CPC funding. Um, the restriction stays with the property. It doesn't matter who owns it. It can be used for historical purposes or a library, and those are the only two purposes. Uh, as far as the logistics of meeting times and everything, the town takes it. That is under the discretion of the library director. Um, you know, the friends would not have any control over that. The town accepts the building. It becomes a town building. As a branch library, it would come under the direction of the director. Thank you. On my left. Uh, thank you, Madam Moderator. Mike Flaherty. To, at this time, I come to the microphone as chairman of the Wareham Free Library Board of Trustees. Um, for those who don't understand the distinction, this is the public library, the Board of Trustees for the pub existing public library. Um, our board met and deliberated on this. We heard a long pre presentation from the friends. And ultimately, we voted in favor of this passage, uh, not only in the passage of this article, not only in favor of passage, passing this article, but to uh, actively promote its passage. So to that end, I, I, on behalf of the trustees, I urge passage of this article. Uh, and that vote was, um, we were a nine-member board. One, one member was not present. That vote was six in favor and two opposed. Thank you. Thank you. On my right, Andrea Smith. I just want to express concern for the town's current financial crisis and future financial crisis. For those who read the uh, projection by the Capital Planning Committee, uh, there are, uh, in FY 2014, the town is going to need to come up to meet capital needs over and above the budget. In 2014, nearly $3 million. In 2015, $2 million. That's the year we're supposed to be taking the library over. And in 2016, $2,126,000. I don't know how, if we have these capital needs, which are very, very serious needs, we can go ahead and plan at this time where we're going to find $40,000 to run a library extension if we can't even fund the things that are basic, essential needs that have to be purchased. Thank you. On my left. Madam Moderator, ladies and gentlemen, Cliff Sylvia, Precinct 1. Um, I rise in support of uh, the article uh, for several reasons. Uh, first and foremost, Onset is a jewel. And our youngsters that live in Onset are jewels. And the Spinney Library, uh, newly renovated, which probably means that won't need any major uh, capital, uh, have any major capital problems uh, in terms of repair, um, is a beautiful, beautiful um, building. Uh, I think that right now we are really, really knee deep in supposition and what if scenarios. Um, you know, we could, we could what if this and uh, come up with all kinds of scenarios why we shouldn't support it. But where I'm at right now is it's a win win. It's a win-win for the town, for the village of Onset. It's a win-win for the kids. Uh, it's a win-win for the public library because we have heard uh, here this evening that several years down the road this will be taken care of, and uh, you know after that 
who knows you know certainly uh, the public library has come under scrutiny before and uh, I'm sure it'll come under scrutiny again so uh, if, if down the road we have uh, fiscal problems that cannot be addressed and if down the road um, the, the library funding uh, comes into question again then we'll deal with it but for right now we've got a couple of three years 30 seconds we've got a couple of three years that we can have this so from where I sit it's a win-win and I strongly urge to support this article thank you gentlemen on my right <clears throat> about once every 10 years I make an emotional decision <laughs> ladies there, and gentlemen there are many friends in this hall who I am sure will disagree with me but I rise in support of this sometimes you do things just because you have a vision of what could be what should be what would be wonderful and I think this is one of those times for me I greatly respect the people on the other side of this issue because there are lots of arguments I could make in it with my compulsively logical mind but sometimes you just want to do something that feels good and right thank you I'm not sure if it was Mrs. Winslow or Mr. Heath. Mr. Heath, you, were you next? Ms. The speaker on the left was up before I was. Was she before you? Okay. This is Ricky. On my left. Susan Ricky, Precinct 2. I guess I'm known as an extreme optimist because I know that this building is something that probably will be there forever. We've had dedicated volunteers for over the years that have got together and did the, raised the money and rolled up their sleeves. And I think for two years, we should be able to give them the opportunity to see how much more they can do. And I invite a lot of people to raise their hand as volunteers in the community. That's the way we're going to get ahead. We're going to have to become volunteers. If we're in financial straits, then let's raise our hands and get some grant money. It's out there. There are volunteers out there. We've seen it happen, and we have to go in this direction. For two years, we really need to have this open, and I think it would be a very positive for the community. I urge you to vote for Article 35. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Heath. Madam Moderator, I also like the idea of the spinning. I think branch libraries are wonderful and they're fantastic, but unfortunately I'm chairman of the Finance Committee and I have to go back to the numbers. Right now, the main library needs, we have actually have bids, needs over 200,000, or close to $200,000 worth of uh, repairs. The only way to repair that library at this point would be to borrow. And we would borrow over a five year period, and that means over the next five years we need $40,000 a year. Well, the first two years we're fine with spending, no problem. We got 40000 each year from the friends. However, years three, four, and five, we'd have the debt of 40000 plus the operation of 40000 The alternative is not to fix the main library, and I think that's totally unacceptable. Selectman Winslow. Thank you, Madam Moderator. I just want to clarify. Uh, some of the points that have come up about the needs of the main library. The main library does have needs. However, with or without the acceptance of Spinney, the main library is going to have needs. It's not the purpose of the Friends of the Library to fund capital improvements. That's not what they exist for. And I would invite anybody in this room to connect with them and understand what their, their purpose is. And also understand that this is a gift. This isn't something that the town has to consider spending money on for a minimum of two years. And I share the optimism of previous speakers. I think we're on the upswing. I think we've got a, a tough decision budget that's going to take us into a better place next year. And I think that this is something that the very worst that can happen is that in two years we can't operate it. And we have to sit here again, neighbors, citizens of this community and make a difficult decision and we can do that but in the interim we have something to offer the entire community and especially the residents of onset 
So many people have worked so hard to get to this day. From this agree the agreement was signed in 2005. The idea is older than that. 30 seconds. Let's give it a chance. Because if we don't try, we'll never really know in the end. Thank you. On my right, Mr. Camarano. Madam Moderator, uh, just maybe some information. Um, if we keep the library, we have two free years. If it doesn't work, we can always close it. I think that give it the two years, uh, it's a great asset. And if it doesn't work, we can always close it. That will save the town its financial uh, problem. Thank you. Thank you. On my right, is, is that Mrs. Weir again? Um, I have another question. Uh, if, is, is, is Mrs. Weir, sorry, I have to put my other glasses on. Um, you've, you already uh, used your allotted time. So, um, because oh, I didn't think I used my whole time. All right, let May me check. With, for let me check. Time to ask well, for since you've already spoken, let me go to the lady that's behind you who has sure. an opportunity, and I'll check on your time. Okay. On my right. On my right. Michelle Rose, Precinct 1. I move to vote. Thanks, we have a motion before us to move the question. It requires a two-thirds vote. I think vote. I was standing before her, so I, I'm, I'm a little. But you already had you had already stood it and I'm spoken, so I have to go to someone who hasn't had the opportunity. Right? I, I don't think I had. I just had a question. Yeah. The motion before us is to move the question. It requires a two-thirds vote. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed. No. The vote now will come on the article before us, which is Article 35. Okay. This will require a two-thirds vote because it's an acceptance of land. I will try for a voice vote. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. It passes by a two-thirds voice vote. Ladies and gentlemen, please. Madam Clerk. Article 30. Point of order, Madam Moderator. State your vote. point. We have a vote, please. I only see three, one, two, one, two, three, four, five. We have a question to the vote. Tell us, please come forward. Ladies and gentlemen, please raise your, your cards up high and hold them there. Do not hold them down. The tellers can't see them and they will not be able to count your vote. All those in favor, please help raise your hands and hold your cards. Section 1? 4141. Section 141. Section 2? Uh, 34. Section 2, 34. Section 3? 76. 
Section 376. Section 4? Section 442. 4-2. Section 442. All those opposed, please raise your cards. Please keep your cards up high until you're told to put them down. Section 1? 5. Section 2? 13. Section 2, 13. Section 3? 21. Section 3, 21. Section 4? 9. Section 4 is 9. It passes by a two-thirds vote. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please. Article 30. Article 30. May I have a motion? Madam Moderator, I move as printed in the warrant. That's what it says. I have a second. I have a second. To speak to the article on my left. Madam Moderator, Susan Rickey, Chairman of Community Events. I encourage a positive vote on this article. Um, each year we get money sent from the state from the parking receipts and the hotel motel taxes. And last year we were able to help promote, advertise, at least 26 events in the town of Wareham. Uh, we also support the Wareham fireworks, which is a big event. So I urge everyone to um, vote in favor of this article. Thank you. May I have the vote of the Board of Selectmen? Madam Moderator, the Board of Selectmen voted favorable action. Three in favor, zero opposed, and zero abstentions. May I have a vote and recommendation of the Finance Committee? The Finance Committee voted favorable action eight in favor, zero, uh, zero negative, and zero abstain. The Finance Committee recommends favorable action on this article. Funds in excess of 25000 are to be appropriated at Fall Town Meeting. Is there anything further to be said on Article 30? Seeing no one standing, I'll now call for a vote. This requires a majority vote. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed? Passes unanimously. Madam Clerk. Article 24. I have a motion. Madam Moderator, I move that Article 24 be voted as printed in the warrant. I have a second. Second. I have a second to speak to the article. Dr. Rabinovich? Yes. <clears throat> Similar to um, a, a previous article, this allows us to transfer the funds from the revolving account that was constituted under Chapter 44 um, into the new revolver that was established under 
Chapter 71. This is for special ed tuition, particularly for those students attending the West Wareham Academy. May I have the vote of the Board of Selectmen? Madam Moderator, the Board of Selectmen voted favorable action. Three in favor, zero opposed, and zero abstentions. May I have the vote and recommendation of the Finance Committee? No. I believe that vote was incorrect. Oh, I'm sorry. I read the wrong one. Uh, it's zero in favor, zero, three opposed, and zero abstentions. May I have a vote and recommendation of the FinCon? The Finance Committee voted favorable action 7-4-0 against zero abstain. The Finance Committee recommends favorable action on this article to transfer the existing current revolver account balance as discussed in Article 21 to a new revolver account. Thank you. Is there anything to be said on Article 24? On my right. Um, Michelle Langford, District 4, through you, Madam Moderator, can I ask why the selectmen voted against it? If they care to answer. I wasn't in attendance that evening, ma'am. I don't know if there's anybody. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair. Nobody knows. To answer the question. Um, yeah, I'm going back in my mind. It was. It had to do with the fact that I believe the board. I don't want to speak for everybody, but I believe <laughs> that the board didn't agree with the original article itself, which sets up this article to move the money. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe Mrs. Begley, you were there with me that evening. Is that about right? We didn't agree with the original. Correct. Right. That's why. Thank you. Is there anything further to be said on Article 24? Seeing no one standing, I'll now call for a vote on Article 24. It requires a majority vote. Article 24 is to be voted as printed in the warrant. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed? No. Passes by a majority. Article 15. May I have a motion? Madam Moderator, I move that Article 15 be voted as printed in the warrant. Thank you. Do I hear a second? Second. I have a second. To speak to the article? Point of, point of order. I believe 15 was on the consent agenda, wasn't yes, it? Yes, on the Number second two. consent agenda. Yeah, you're correct. Very yeah. definite postponement. We already took this one. Let me just... Uh, we did? Yeah. No, I'm sorry. No. What was on the consent agenda was 12, 14, 16, 17, and 29. We have not done Article 15. Madam Moderator, I'm going to ask that the Harbor Master come to speak to this article. Certainly. To speak to the article. Good evening, Gary Buck, Mr. Harbor Master. Um, this is just a, every year we have to bring this to Springtown meeting. This puts a cap on the amount of money that we're allowed to spend under shellfish propagation. This allows us to plant areas, uh, run aquaculture programs, um, assist in the aquaculture program trying to increase the shellfish population around town. Uh, it's capped at, I believe, 30,000, and uh, I think that's about it. <laughs> Thank you. May I have the vote of the Board of Selectmen? Uh, Madam Moderator, the Board of Selectmen voted favorable action, three in favor, zero opposed, and zero abstentions. Thank you. May I have the vote of recommendation of the Finance Committee? The Finance Committee voted favorable action, 7-0-0. Thank you. Is there anything to be said on Article 15? Seeing no one standing, I'll now call for the vote. The motion before you on Article 15 is as printed in the warrant. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed? Passes unanimous. It passes by majority. I think I did hear one now. 
Passes by majority. Article 42. A motion? Um, okay. Madam Moderator, I move to approve the article as printed in the warrant. Can I have a second? Second. To speak to the article? Sandy Slavin, Precinct 3, Chair, Affordable Housing Trust. This is just to align our reappointment so that we don't all leave in the same year. It's staggered like all the other committees in town. Please approve. Thank you. May I have the vote of the Board of Selectmen? Madam Moderator, the Board of Selectmen voted favorable action. Three in favor, zero opposed, and zero abstentions. Thank you. May I have the vote and recommendation of the Finance Committee? Finance Committee voted favorable action, seven in favor, zero against, and zero abstain. Thank you. Is there anything to be said on Article 42? Seeing no one to speak, I will now, now call for a vote on Article 42 as printed in the warrant. It requires a majority vote. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Passes unanimously. Article 28. May I have a motion? Madam Moderator, I move that the town appropriate the amount of $575,000 for the purpose of paying costs of a feasibility study at the Minot Forest Elementary School in Wareham, including the payment of all costs incidental or related thereto, and for which the town may be eligible for a grant from the Massachusetts School Building Authority, set amount to be expended under the direction of the school committee. To meet this appropriation, the treasurer, with the approval of the Board of Selectmen, is authorized to borrow set amount under and pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter 44, are pursuant to any other enabling authority. The town acknowledges that the MSBA's grant program is a non-entitlement discretionary program based on need as determined by the MSBA, and any cost the town incurs in excess of any grant approved by and received from the MSBA shall be the sole responsibility of the town, and further provided that the appropriation hereunder shall be subject to and contingent upon an affirmative vote of the town to ex exempt the amounts required for the payment of interest in principal on said borrowing from the limitations on taxes imposed by Mass General Law 59, Section 21C, Proposition 2 and a half, and that the amount of borrowing authorized pursuant to this vote shall be reduced by any grant amount set forth in the feasibility study agreement that may be executed between the town and the MSBA. I have a second. To speak to the article? Yes. Um, I raise in, um, in favor of this. The Minot Forest building was built in the 1960s. Um, the school needs a lot of work. The electrical systems, the heating systems, our single pane windows, um, classroom ventilations that were built into closets, um, asbestos tiles that need to be taken up. Um, there's a lot of work that has to be done on this building. The Mass School Building Authority gave us the language. Um, the first part of this is to do the feasibility study. What do we get for $575,000? We get studies that are done for traffic, geological, educational studies, 
we hire an owner's representative as well as an architect so that we come up with a set of plans. We then meet with the Mass School Building Authority and negotiate what they will pay, whether it will be at the 60% low end or will it be a higher amount. That has to be determined in negotiations with them as well as what they will fund. The building of, um, committee that we earlier agreed to will be the ones that will sit down with these documents and will work with the owner's representative and the architect to come up with a set of plans and to do the negotiating with the Mass School Building Authority. We will be reimbursed at least 60% of this 575000 On a recent um, conference call with our acting town administrator and myself, we were told that after we get a bill for any of the work that is done in this project, we will be able to submit it and the 60% will be paid within 14 days so that we will quickly be able to pay off the 60% as the bills come in and we will only be, have to take the loan out uh, and pay off the 40%. So that's why the $3.19 for the five years as a debt exclusion for this project is not for the full 575, it's for 60% of this. This is the first step in getting a rebuilt building an enlarged building so that the students will have a first-rate educational facility that they deserve. Thank you. May I have a vote of the Board of Selectmen? Madam Moderator, the Board of Selectmen voted favorable action. One in favor, two opposed, and zero abstentions. Thank you. May I have the vote and recommendation of the Finance Committee? Madam Moderator, the Finance Committee voted favorable action, six in the affirmative, one against, zero abstentions. Thank you. Is there anything to be said on Article 28? Seeing on my right. Am I correct that the school, if the, um, if the feasibility study is approved, if the state approves the funding after the feasibility study, that it would begin um, construction in approximately 2017, is that correct? Is that the year that's being looked at? To answer the question? There is no year attached because we first have to get accepted the um, plan, the building committee, the architectural design, um, and then go through the bid process. So it's really unsure how fast this will happen. Plus, we have to come back to town meeting once we know what the full cost of the project is and ask for that funding. So it's too early to say what the date would be. My understanding from the report that capital planning set forth is that they're estimating it for 2017. They have an estimated cost on it of 13500000 to the town. But in that same year, the total expectation of need for capital uh, funding is $64,219,000. I would like to know if we can have an explanation of what other things we're going to be asked to fund in addition to the school so that we can weigh whether we should proceed forward with a school feasibility study because I don't, you know, I support the work if we're not going to get caught up in a $64 million borrowing in one year, but I am concerned that we have multiple needs here and that they should be weighed before we spend $500,000 for a study when we might find we can't go forward with the project because of the other 30 needs. seconds. To answer the question, select Ms. Slavin. On that particular capital plan, it's basically listed out at $25 million per school, also including the Deca school. Both schools are in the, in the queue for possible either repair, renovation, or replacement. The gross figure was put in there for the total amount. The net figure was based on the original 48% going back a couple years ago. 
Since then, the state has moved up to 60 percent because Warham qualifies at a higher rate than a lot of other areas. The possibility of 70 percent payment would be due to if we have a lot of green initiatives in the project. So that $64 million figure includes, I think, a new police station and several other large items. We put them out to 2017 to put them five years out simply because we didn't know when the actual time frame would come, but we knew it would come within five years, so we put it out the farthest out possible. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anything further to be said on Article 28? Seeing no one standing, I now will call for the vote as it appears before you on the screen. This does require a two-thirds vote because it is borrowing. I will try for a voice vote. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. Passes by a two-thirds. Madam Clerk. Article 25. May I have a motion? Madam Moderator, I move that the town vote to transfer 60000 from the Transportation Revolving Fund to purchase or lease new and or use vehicles for the school transportation department. Do I have a second? I am sorry, I didn't hear. Do I have a second? Okay. To speak to the article. There is a need um, for us to take back some work that we've had to um, farm out to private vendors. And um, the only way to do that is to buy some uh, vans, some used vans, and so we would like to take $60,000 that is within the revolving account now, encumber the money so that we can buy the vehicles that we need to uh, take that work back. May I have the vote of the Board of Selectmen? Uh, Madam Moderator, the Board of Selectmen voted favorable action, zero in favor, three opposed, and zero abstentions. May I have the vote and recommendation of the Finance Committee? Madam Moderator, the Finance Committee reconsidered this from its original vote and has voted favorable action, five in favor, uh, no negatives, and no abstentions. Would you repeat that, please? Yes, the Finance Committee had reconsidered the, the, uh, the motion from its original vote. And its final vote is five in favor, no negatives, no abstentions. Thank you. On my right. Thank you. Um, with the reconsideration of the vote, if I may, I'd like to ask the Finance Committee what changed their mind from being in favor of it to against it? To answer the question? Or in, against it to in favor of it. Originally, when the motion came to us, we were talking $100,000. We had some question as to what this actually meant as far as putting the money aside. Basically, what happens is the $60,000 becomes encumbered. All right. We are also, cons which means it can't be spent for anything else. It can only be spent for the buses, and it would carry from year to year. We also checked with legal counsel as to whether or not the buses could be purchased or how they would be purchased, and we were advised that if it was a used vehicle, that it would have to go through uh, Chapter was it, 30B procurement procedure, yeah. which is what we would want it to do, obviously, because it means it has to go out to bid. If it was a new vehicle, it has to come back to town meeting after it's been purchased. It's basically, what this does is it provides the ability of the school committee in the case of a failure of one of the buses to make an emergency purchase. Well, I might as well go over 100 this town meeting, but um, I would urge people to vote against this. It's new and or used vehicles. Um, the school department, I mean, the um, transportation committee um, has a long history of buying used vehicles. As a matter of fact, the um, 2005 buses, I believe, that they bought, they bought five of them. They're the ones with the highest failure rate, and yet we always hear about the old buses because you don't know what you're getting with used vehicles. Also, it says vehicles. It doesn't say special ed vans or wheelchair accessible vehicles. This could be a new car for the transportation director. 
there were complaints about that a few years ago that the transportation director had one and the new transportation director drives out of town. Maybe that's ready for a new one. So I would urge you to vote against this unless they are going to clarify exactly what they want. Thank you. Selectman Slavin. On this particular article where it says new, we do have a process for new vehicles that has to go through capital planning through the town administrator for town meeting to approve it. What I would suggest we do is to modify this article to strictly have it as used vehicles. That way there we don't bypass the system. Selectman Bagley. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Um, I have a problem with this given that the, um, there was already a purchase this year of a $92,000 bus that circumvented this town meeting process and the procurement process. And I just am, want them to come before us. This is the voting body. We're all voting on many money articles. And when it says used vehicles, we have plenty of used vehicles already in the lot. I mean, are these going to be vans that are coming off a lease that have already been used and abused by a, another entity? and we're just going to take them on and have to have the maintenance costs. I think that this is certainly not specific enough for me and shouldn't be specific enough for this body, and I urge you to vote against this article. Gentleman on my left. Madam Moderator, ladies and gentlemen. Um, again, uh, we, we can what if this, and we can make suppositions, and we can make erroneous claims. The bottom line is the superintendent has told you exactly what we're going to use this for. It's not going to be a car for the transportation director. It's not going to be a convertible for the chairman of the board of selectmen, I mean uh, school board, <laughs> or the board of selectmen. <laughs> it's not, it's not. You know my cousin the shop right now, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's intended to be used in the exact way that our superintendent dictated. Ladies and gentlemen, let's get beyond this bickering on this transportation. Vote this article and let's get this town meeting over with. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. On my right, ladies and gentlemen, please. On my right, Mrs. Bont. I agree with the previous speaker, but one other thing I wanted to add to this is um, say that they're faced with a, a, a sped bus breaks down and we have to pay to get someone to go to Brockton because we, we have to get them to Brockton because that's what, where they have to go to school. So what do you want to do? Have the, have the superintendent farm it out for $200, say, a trip versus you can get a used bus and, and do it much more cost effectively, and that's their intent, to do things cost effectively, and get them up at a lo much lower price and we'd have our own vehicle. By not passing this, you're tying their hands and you're going to make them spend more money. This is nothing but a cost-effective move, ladies and gentlemen. It's, please vote in favor of it. On my right, Mr. McDonald. Uh, Madam Moderator, to you to the body, I originally voted against this article. One of my problems was it was too open-ended. But there are several things they've added since that time. One thing is the understanding that it's $60,000. Once that's gone, they have to come back to us. It's encumbered. It can't be spent for anything else. Now, it's used in new equipment. Now, whether it's a bus or a van, that's all I care about, whether it's a bus, bus or a van. But it's $60,000, and it's encumbered for this purpose only. When it's gone, if something happens this year, or something breaks down and they've spent it all, then it's gone. And it's also subject to 30B procurement laws. That's an important factor. It's not they just go out and spend it. There are laws that govern that. So I would urge you to vote for this, and let's move on. Thank you. Am I right? Um, if I may, the school department uh, or the transportation revolving fund has usually about two to three hundred thousand dollars a year in it um, and this is the first time it's ever come in front of this body so I'm glad they're going to hold sixty thousand um, dollars what are they doing with the rest of it thank you on my left point of information math is John precinct three is there 
a possibility that this $60,000 for transportation, the Council of Aging could benefit because we've had emergency situations where someone is needed and a layperson has driven a person to the Boston Hospital. And it would be nice if more than one group could benefit. Um, I raised the answer to the previous question. I'm not sure that there was a question there. I think it was a statement. No, I was pointing information. I wanted to know if that was feasible, if that could be amended to say that in not just the school transportation, but this new $60,000 could benefit perhaps the COA. No, I'm sorry. No, it's not. I can't be. Okay. The, the question that I raised to answer was about that sometimes is $200,000 and what happens to the rest of the money? Because this account is underfunded by the town every year, it's been funded at the same amount for the last six years. Last year, we used all of the money in the revolving account to make up the deficit. $180,000 from the revolving account put back into the town budget to make it go away. That's where the money goes. Thank you. On my right. Uh, Madam Moderator, uh, I move the question. Thank you. We have a, a motion before us to move the question. It requires a two-thirds vote. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed? No. It passes. We now have before you Article 25 uh, to transfer $60,000 from the Transportation Revolving Fund to purchase or lease new and or used vehicles for the School Transportation Department. It requires a majority vote. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed? No. Passes by a majority. Madam Clerk. Madam Moderator. 11. Article 11. To what do, reason do you rise? Personal privilege. I would like to know the exact number of uh, articles we have remaining and possible completion of this uh, town meeting. We have five articles remaining. I would, in view of the time, it would it be appropriate to make a motion that we continue town meeting to the completion of the five articles? You certainly may. I, I so move. Can I have a second to go beyond the hour 10 to complete the remaining five articles? I have a second. I will now take a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? The chair is in doubt. I'm going to I'm going to take a hand count. Would you tell us, please come forward. All those in favor, please raise your cards and hold them up high. Keep them up so we can try to take this count as quickly as possible. Section 1. Section 127, 27. Section 127. Section 2. Uh, 9. Section 2, 9. Section 3. 57. Section 3, 57. Section 4. Section 4, 25, 25. 25, 25. All those opposed, please raise your cards and hold them high.
Please hold those cards up high. Keep them up, please, until you're told to put them down. Trixie, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to talk to you after. It's okay, Steve. I'm exercising the world. Section 1? 13, 1, 3. Section 1 is 13. Section 2? 30. Section 2 is 30. Section 3? 26. 26. Section 4? 32, 3, 2. 32. We have 118 in the affirmative, 101 in the negative. We will be staying past 10 o'clock to finish up the completion. We only have one more article, and then the rest are no, are no money articles. Article 11. I move that the town vote to appropriate $683,111 to the emergency medical services salary and wage account and $165,219 to the emergency medical services general expense account and further to authorize $848,330 in estimated receipts of the emergency medical services to be used to offset said appropriation in accordance with Mass General Law, Chapter 44, Section 53E. Do I have a second? Thank you. To speak to the article? Madam Moderator, through you to the body, Article 11 is to vote to authorize the appropriation for the emer emergency medical services. Their funds are offset by the revenues that they receive. Thank you. May I have a vote of the Board of Selectmen? Madam Moderator, the Board of Selectmen voted favorable action. Three in favor, zero opposed, zero abstentions. I have the vote and recommendation of the Finance Committee. The Finance Committee voted favorable action, seven in favor, zero opposed, zero abstained. Thank you. Is there anything to be said on Article 11? Seeing nobody standing, I'll now call for vote on Article 11. It requires a majority vote. We're voting on the article as it appears before you on the screen. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Passes by majority. Madam Clerk? Article 46. I believe this was a petition article. May I have a motion by the petitioner? I move, move to, to see if the town will vote to rescind the preservation restriction language placed upon the Fearing Tavern in Wareham, owned by the Wareham Historical Society, and designated on Assessor's Map 132, Lot 1001, as approved under the Fall 2006 Town Meeting Article 24. Would you just state your name, please? September McCarthy, Thank Precinct you. 1. Do I have a second? I have a second. To speak to the article? All right. I'll try to keep this brief, uh, considering the late hour. In fall of 2006, the uh, Community Preservation Committee recommended to town meeting that a uh, historical preservation restriction be placed on the Fearing Tavern. The understanding by the Historical Society in the town, and I think all involved at the time, was that it was a formality, more of a formality than anything else, and uh, presented as a condition of receiving in the future any funds from CPC or CPA uh, funds, etc. Six years later, uh, last fall, we finally received a draft of the historic preservation restriction and began to get a better understanding of the financial and legal ramifications of such a restriction. 
The Board of Directors of the Historical Society discussed this at length over many months, and we have basically come to a couple of conclusions on it. Um, number one, as a historical society, we have for more than 50 years now uh, followed our charter, which is to preserve the history of Wareham. And in the uh, in pursuing that, we have acquired the Fearing Tavern, amongst other buildings, and restored it completely, despite the fact that at the time when we acquired it, back in the late, early 60s, late 50s, the fire chief of Wareham wanted it condemned. It was in such bad shape. Um, we have successfully done so, restoring it to its historic uh, significance within the town and continue to maintain it over that time. There's no reason to believe that we won't continue to do that. Um, and that is our first uh, situation on it. Secondly, the financial and legal implications uh, would place an undue burden on the Historical Society. And there is activity going on by the Historic District Commission uh, along their preservation plan to expand the historic district so that it would include the Fearing Tavern in the future, near future. Um, at that point then, we would be required to go before the Historic District Commission in order to receive approval to do any work on the exterior of our building. Having a historic preservation restriction in place at the same time on the property that would be, as according to the CPC, held by the town of Wareham would also then require us to go before the Historic Commission for approval on the same projects, no matter who was funding them. Uh, the, those are our objections to it at this point. Um, on top of it, the really, uh, the difficult part is that the town itself does not have any formal procedures or processes in place to administer this historic preservation. There are no gu design guidelines in which to make fair and impartial judgments about pro projects. Uh, there's no funding for these either of these committees, the Historic District Commission or the Historic Commission, in order for them to be able to consult with experts um, in any way to make it a fair situation. And what we're asking the town at this point is to rescind this requirement on the historic society for the present time and um, with the understanding that we will continue to work with the CPC, with the historic commission, with the historic district commission in helping to achieve the preservation needs of the town and interests of the town. Thank you. May I have the vote of the Board of Selectmen? Madam Moderator, the Board of Selectmen voted favorable action, two in favor, one opposed, and zero abstained. Thank you. May I have the vote and recommendation of the Finance Committee? Madam Moderator, at the time that the Finance Committee considered this motion, that we heard no objections uh, to the motion. So our, we voted favorable action, eight for, no against, no abstention. Thank you. Is there anything to be said on Article 46 to my left? Angela Dunham. Precinct 3, in the interest of disclosure, I serve on several of these committees that were mentioned, CPC Chair, Wareham Historical Commission, Wareham Historical Society, and Lynott Forest. I wear my CPC hat to address this issue. CPC does not question the integrity or dedication of the Wareham Historical Society and ensures, uh, excuse me, the HPR process is extremely slow process and tailored to the individual property. CPC, Community Preservation Committee, Wareham Historical Commission, Wareham Historical District Commission, Wareham Historical Society, we're all on the same page. We are all working toward the same goal to protect and preserve our historic properties. While the law does not state that an HPR is necessary, it is in the spirit of the law that we are following. And of 140 CPA committees, uh, communities, excuse me, no other has asked to ever rescind an HPR. A letter from Kathleen Colleri, 
Chief Bureau of Municipal Finance Law, Department of Revenue, states in a case regarding a grain trawl in Norfolk, Mass., and that is one of the three handouts that were available to you as you came in. And I'm going to try to paraphrase because of the hour. Um, private nonprofit organizations are allowed rehabilitation or restoration of historic Happy properties seconds. if it is for a public use. Even though it's privately owned, it's, it's allowed. However, under the anti-aid amendment to the Massachusetts Constitution, public funds cannot be given or loaned to private individuals or organizations for their private purposes. However, it is generally understood to have a legitimate, if it is uh, understood to have a legitimate public purpose, then both federal and state governments, for example, have various historic grant programs, which include grants to nonprofit organizations. Um, sorry, may I ask for a minute? I want to ask the point before the board, would you like to give Mrs. Dunham another minute? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? You have another minute. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, they had written to Kathleen Caleri in regards to a Grange property in Norfolk, Mass. And to paraphrase, in the case of the Grange property, they understood that the town would acquire a historic preservation restriction and the organization had to use the funds received in exchange to finance the rehabilitation. In other words, it appears that the town would be receiving an interest in the property. So to, to cut it short, you cannot take the money and run. In other words, if you've taken town taxpayer money and CPC money is town taxpayer money, there has to be oversight mm -hmm. to guard your taxpayers' purposes. This is a public building, of course. There are guidelines already in place at the state level where him, CPC, will work diligently with historic, uh, excuse me, the Wareham Historical Society to resolve this issue. I ask you respectfully to please vote this article down. On the left. Excuse me. George Barrett, uh, I'm the planning board representative to CPC, and I'd like to amend Article 46 to further study. We have a motion before an amendment before us for further study. Anything to be said on the amendment? Yeah, the difficulties mentioned earlier uh, between the society or the Ferring Tavern and the holders of the HPI, which is the Historic Commission, I think need to be worked out between those two bodies and not this body. And if they cannot come to a conclusion, then maybe come back to the town meeting. Thank you. Is there anything further to be said on, on the um, amendment? Am I right? Hi. September McCarthy again. Uh, in terms of the amendment the proposed to recommend for further study, uh, this actually speaks to the uh, larger issue here in that in this case and in many others, the town itself has been designated as the holder of the preservation restriction. Um, and in this particular instance, the Wareham Historic Commission has been designated, uh, in form somehow designated as the body or committee that will administer this AHPR. Uh, but this is very informal. There are no bylaws. The Historic Commission has not been given this responsibility per our charter or bylaws. They have not been given any financing in order to do so. There are financial and legal obligations pertaining to this. There are design guidelines that should be available and criteria um, on which to determine whether or not projects that come before them in requesting certificate of appropriateness or whatever is required. Um, be judged on, and there's no appeal process, there's no policies written, and there's no, no process in place for the administration of the town to validate and be sure, ensure that all of this is being done appropriately. As an example, um, I've done some research, and the town of Falmouth is a good example of a very formalized process, very well set out 
their application even for CPC funds is 17 pages long because it includes the criteria by which they evaluate proposals. Ten. There's a 92 page design guideline booklet, booklet that they use and that's what I have to say. That's what Thank I'd like you. to see done here in this town before we agree to put this kind of a permanent restriction on our property. Thank you. And if we could keep our comments to uh, the amendment before us, which is for this study, your reasons why you support it or why you don't support it. Gentleman on my right. Joseph Mulker in Precinct 2. In my previous town, I was on the uh, CPC funds, and we had the same policy set up. And if, if a private entity like the Historical Commission doesn't want to go along with it, they don't have to accept the money. That's all it puts out the point is. If they don't want the money, they don't have to uh, go with the petition, okay? Thank you. On my left. Uh, Nancy Miller Onset, um, also CPC. I have been involved with this since the beginning, um, uh, and I support the amendment for further study. Uh, quite frankly, CPC was blindsided by this. We had no idea there was a problem. We have been working since 2007 in trying to come to an agreement on a number of things. What Mrs. McCarthy is talking about is um, uh, called a Memorandum of Understanding. The uh, document that we have been working on is the preservation restriction. But there will be a Memorandum of Understanding which gives the day-to-day uh, workings of association between the Historical Commission and the Historical Society. Um, you're listening to a situation where the person doesn't necessarily understand what's going on. I did speak to DOR today and uh, they stand by the fact that if you are a nonprofit and you are taking CPC funds you must have a preservation restriction on the property because the um, uh, 30 seconds. I'm sorry. The um, Commonwealth's um, uh, bylaws, or I'm actually using the wrong, wrong, wrong language, but basically the Constitution of Massachusetts says that a town may not give money to a nonprofit unless there is a preservation restriction. DOR said today they stand beside that and they will go with CPC on this. So please further study it. We will come back if we cannot come to an agreement and they will have to give CPC back all the money I'm, spent. On my left. Brian O'Boyle, I'd like to move the question. Thank you, we have a motion before us to move the question. It requires a two thirds vote. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed? We now will take it, it passes it now. We will now take a vote on the amendment for further study. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed? It does pass by majority. The amendment now becomes the main motion. The main motion now is for further study. It requires a majority vote. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed? It passes unanimously. Article 32. Madam Moderator, I move to approve bylaw as printed in the handout. Thank you. May I have a second? To speak to the article, Article 32. To speak to the article? Yes, um, I'm Wayham Animal Control Officer, Cheryl Gravett Dill, and uh, the article before you is uh, two different sections. One is the barking, howling nuisance 
bylaw. And um, in the town of Wingham right now, we have a lot of barking, viol calls, complaints that come in. Um, in 2012, I've actually already investigated 42 of those. And uh, this barking bylaw addresses the barking issue for what it is, barking dogs. Um, the state law is very vague. It does force us to investigate these complaints. And basically, it doesn't give you strong guidelines on what actually is a barking bylaw violation, I mean, barking violation. So it's very vague and it leaves a lot of confusion. With the bylaw, we would actually add clarity, what would be acceptable, normal barking, and what would be excessive and need to be addressed. Again, it's something we're already dealing with and what we're looking for is to be proactive and handle it in more clear, defined means. Uh, the second portion of this would be the dangerous and potentially dangerous dogs. And basically, I receive uh, bite, dog bite complaints on a regular basis. This is something we're dealing with in this town. And again, the state law is vague. It's a long, drawn-out process. And what we're looking to is implement some um, safety measures that improve not only the dog owner's safety, but also the general public. Um, simple means that wouldn't actually harm anybody or harm the dog that we could implement immediately if we have a problem with a dangerous or potentially dangerous dog here in town. Um, and so both of these bylaws would have a lot of improvement in the way that these two issues could be handled. They would improve public safety, uh, clear up some confusion about what would be considered an issue with barking and not an issue. Like I said, we're already dealing with it, so we're not looking to open up a can of worms. We're actually just looking to resolve an ongoing issue in a better way. Um, to be honest with you, the dangerous and potentially dangerous portion of this could be a matter of life and death. Dogs are, have the potential of killing somebody, so this is a very serious matter, and um, through the state law, it could be a long, drawn-out process before we can take safety measures. With this, we could immediately improve the safety of all parties involved and um, potentially save a life. So I stand behind both these sections. Thank you. I just have one question for you because I'm not sure I heard correctly. On your motion, was the motion as printed in the handout? It was modified from the... But is it pr as printed in the handout because the handout is different than the warrant? That's correct. Okay, so it says printed in the handout. Yes, we, we spoke... Thank you. Okay, that's all I needed to know. I just wanted to clarify that it's as printed in the handout. Hey, I have the voter. Do you have anything further to say, or? No, that's good. Okay. Um, may I have the vote of the Board of Selectmen? Uh, Madam Moderator, the Board of Selectmen voted favorable action. Two in favor, one opposed, zero abstained. May I have the vote and recommendation of the Finance Committee? The Finance Committee voted favorable action, two in favor, one negative, and five abstentions. The majority of the Finance Committee abstained with the understanding that there would be significant amendments made here at town meeting. Thank you. Is there anything to be said on the article, gentlemen on my right? Uh, I have a question uh, through you to, I believe, the town council, and then I have uh, an extensive amendment. My question is, if somebody was assessed a fine under this article and they believed it was an unjust fine and refused to pay it, what would be the procedure? To answer the question? Uh, Madam Moderator, through you to the previous speaker, I, I certainly would defer to the proponent for a full explanation of how she thinks this would work, but my understanding of it is that it would be enforced through the non-criminal disposition process where a ticket would be issued depending on which offense uh, the, the amount would vary. If uh, the alleged offender uh, wanted to 
give in, you could pay the fine, and that would be the end of it. If, however, you didn't want to pay the fine, uh, there would be, it would then switch over from the non-criminal disposition process to the criminal disposition process, and it would be subject to criminal enforcement in front of the clerk magistrate at Wareham District Court. Thank you. Uh, I have an amendment which I have in writing and I will pass up. Uh, I, I propose change to paragraph C. Uh, the current reading is dangerous. Any dog which according to the records of the animal control officer or another appropriate authority has by adding and opinion following the words records resulting in dangerous any dog which according to the records and opinion of the animal control officer or another appropriate authority has. Also change paragraph C subsection B, add the words with malice uh, and following the word animal so that it reads B has killed a domestic animal with malice and without provocation or under the definition of potentially dangerous, add after or private property, parentheses excluding the owner's property, and remove from the end of the paragraph or dangerous animals. Also insert a new section before the section dangerous slash potentially dangerous remedies a section owner notification and appeal. Any owner whose dog is deemed to be dangerous or potentially dangerous shall be notified in writing of the finding and shall have the right to appeal the finding before the Board of Selectmen. The written notice of the finding shall include the reason or reasons for the finding and information on the appeal process. That is my amendment. May I, may I see the amendment, please? I would like to speak to my amendment. Let me take a look at the amendment first. To speak to the amendment? In reading this proposed bylaw, I, I felt that it really wasn't thought out very well. It, I, I would call it a lazy law because it seems to encompass anything and everything to be interpreted at, at, at the whim of the people who are enforcing it at the time. I would like to say I don't own a dog at the moment, I haven't in many years, and don't have any immediate plans for getting one, but I, I, I am sympathetic to dog owners. And in researching this article, I went to the dictionary definitions of several items. Uh, one is draconian, and this is, although I fully agree with the goal of this bylaw. I certainly don't want to be attacked by a dog, I don't want to listen to barking all night. But another definition I, I ran across is the definition of domestic animal, which is in this bylaw. A domestic animal can mean a fish, a mouse, a rat, a chicken, a frog. If your cat kills your neighbor's uh, goldfish, that's okay. But if your dog kills your neighbor's goldfish, it's now a dangerous animal. <laughs> the penalties under this law are very severe. Your 16 or 17 year old teenager can no longer take your dog for a walk. 
A dog that threatened a fish has to wear a muzzle if he leaves your property. Uh, there's a restriction on leash length of three feet. I'd like to show people. This is three feet. It just barely goes from the end of my arm to the ground. This is the length of the, of the leash you have to have once somebody has declared your animal dangerous. And under the law presented in the original article, there's no appeal or even notification that your dog has been declared dangerous. Also, there, there was no restriction as to about things that happen on your own property. So if my dog was on my property, somebody came onto my property and felt, felt threatened, even though the, there was no contact, that dog could be declared potentially dangerous and subject to the same exact penalties as a dog that bit somebody or killed another dog. This just doesn't make sense. Uh, also, also, there's a section which seems to say that any, but anything written down by an animal control officer becomes absolute evidence, and I modified that somewhat so that it also requires the animal control officer, the current animal control officer, to state their personal opinion rather than going by something that might have been written down five years ago by somebody who isn't around to defend what they wrote. In this country, hopefully, we have a right to face our accusers and to appeal unjust decisions, and I think that's what my amendment is meant to do. Thank you. Sir, may I just have your name again, please? My name is Kenneth Levitt, Precinct 1. Thank you. Anything to be said to the amendment of Ms. on the floor? I can repeat it. Under paragraph C, he's going to change in the sentence, dangerous any dog which according to the records of the animal control officer or another appropriate authority has by adding the two words and opinion following the word records so that it would read dangerous any dog which according to the records and opinion of the animal control officer or another appropriate authority has and then it would go on paragraph c where it says dangerous any dog which according to the records and opinion of the animal control officer or another appropriate authority has. If you take out, if you take out, do you have the hand, does everybody have the handout? No. Okay. It would read, In paragraph C, dangerous and potentially dangerous, it would say, instead of the first sentence, dangerous, any dog which, according to the records and opinion of the animal control officer or another appropriate authority has. It would be under paragraph C. Is In paragraph C, sub item B. Madam moderator, point of order. State your point. When you say paragraph C, are you meaning paragraph three? Yeah, see in the hand in the handout that the animal control officer was to supply to town meeting which is why I asked her to clarify whether her motion was in the handout or whether it was in the warrant. And at the beginning of town meeting, there was a handout. I, okay. I didn't get it. So it's, it's, it's not three, it's paragraph C. Madam moderator, through the point of order, the reason I asked the question is this is extremely confusing. 
And I question whether or not uh, this substantially alters the, uh, the spirit of the original amendment. Um, may or may not, I don't know. But what I, I'm a pretty smart guy, and I'm very confused at this point in time. I, I, I fully understand. Um, there should have been some handouts. Her motion was as in the handout. My only suggestion could be that if there is confusion, then obviously um, you would not want to support the amendment. Or the article. So I'll continue to read what the amendment is. And I'll say on line B. Madam moderator, may I ask a question? We have a point of order? Yeah. Uh, yes. Point of order? Yes. Without the handout, we have no idea what we are actually doing. Then my so, suggestion would be when we take a vote that you vote against it. There were handouts available at the opening of town meeting. I apologize that you don't have one, um, but we do have an article before us and we need to act on it. If you're uncertain of it, unsure of it, then all I could suggest is that you have to make your decision accordingly. So is there anything further to be said on the amendment? Seeing no one yeah. rising to speak uh, to the amendment. I'll speak to the amendment. To speak to the amendment. Um, <clears throat> Madam moderator, ladies and gentlemen, um, again, I don't have a dog. Uh, I don't know what it, it seemed to me on the surface when I read the warrant that the um, original um, verbiage in the uh, article uh, made some sense. Um, certainly, I've had to endure living uh, in the proximity of a barking dog at 4 o'clock in the morning. Um, but be that as it may, um, I, I would strongly suggest that we vote down the amendment. Uh, what your pleasure is on the main motion is up to you, but I would vote down the amendment. And um, to be quite honest, if there was ever an article that needed further study, I think this one does. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anything further to be said on the amendment? Say, to speak to the amendment? Yes. Uh, Madam Moderator, through you to the body, Peter Teitelbaum, Precinct 3. In the interest of full disclosure and uh, relating to both the amendment and the article, I do have two dogs, and they both... Are you speaking to the amendment? I, I am okay. speaking to the amendment. Okay. Uh, and recently, to my chagrin this Saturday, I had a visit from the animal control officer with uh, b barking dog complaints about their activities during the day. And she informed me that she had received six calls. This was quite incredible to me, since over 16 years and two pairs of German shepherds at the property, I had never had a visit from animal control on this score. However... I did wander around the neighborhood afterwards and did ascertain that there was one call made by a, a party of summer people immediately down below. I spoke with them. I understood their concerns. I intend to resolve them. Now, all of that all out of the way, uh, I reluctantly urge a no vote on this amendment only because I have prepared a motion for further study and along with that to form a study committee to analyze this in depth. Uh, the, the previous uh, speaker, or rather the amendment maker, uh, was quite accurate in identifying a lot of due process concerns in this article, and also the notion that any appeals have to be made in the district court, rather than before uh, the Board of Selectmen, uh, who I think are better situated uh, than one clerk magistrate uh, rushing through a crowded docket uh, of uh, traffic seconds. tickets, etc., etc., etc. So I would urge uh, a no vote on the amendment uh, only to the extent that I intend to uh, provide my own amendment or rather motion for further study for the body to consider along with a study committee to actually get a, a law done that will actually give the animal control officer more power to deal with dangerous dogs on an immediate basis hopefully and will uh, also give the dog owner better access to due process considerations. Thank you. Time. Is there anything further to be said on the amendment? See, no one, um, the vote will now come on the amendment, uh, which would change paragraph C and would be dangerous any dog which, according to the records and opinion of the animal control officer or another appropriate authority, has. 
in paragraph C, sub item B, would add the words with malice and following the word animal so that it would read, has killed a domestic animal with malice and without provocation. Under the definition of potentially dangerous, you would add after or private property, excluding the owner's property, remove from the end of the paragraph or domestic animals. And then it would insert a new section before the section dangerous and potentially dangerous, which would have a title owner notification and appeal. Any owner whose dog is deemed to be dangerous or potentially dangerous shall be notified in writing of the finding and shall have the right to appeal the finding before the Board of Selectmen. The written notice of the finding shall include the reason for the finding and information on the appeal process. We now have the amendment before you. It requires a majority vote. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, please say no. no. The amendment fails. We now have before you Article 32 as was presented. To speak to Article 32 on my left. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, I stand before the body as the owner of an 11-pound York Yorkie that was attacked by a pit bull in my neighborhood while I was walking my dog, a walk we have taken every day for the last five months. So I stand here in support of the dangerous portion of this amendment. I understand through hearing some of the um, information and the speakers that there needs to be some work done on this. But I urge you not to cut the legs out from under this young woman who is really trying to do something for the community. To date, I have spent $800 in veterinary and in personal medical bills because we were both injured. That pit bull had my dog in his mouth. And if it wasn't because I physically put myself in between my dog and the pit bull and the owner came out of his property to take the pit bull away from the dog, my dog, my dog would be dead today. There are many children in my neighborhood that play on that street. If that had been a child, you all would not be debating this kind of issue. So while we may say it needs further study, and I accept Peter's uh, explanation, seconds. I urge you to give this very, very serious consideration. Wareham has too many dangerous dogs. Thank you. On my right, I believe you have two minutes. Okay, I'd just like to address some of the concerns that were brought up. First of all, there are state laws that cover both these items and there is a due process. What we're looking to do with these two items, number one, most importantly, the dangerous, potentially dangerous dog. Again, on a daily basis, I get complaints on dangerous dogs and this is a serious situation. These dogs are a loaded gun and what we're trying to do is implement safety factors immediately. We had a situation where a pit bull bit the owner's finger off and right now as it stands, under the state law, it could take us months to do things to protect the, the general public safety. I'm looking to be able to put a muzzle on a dog that bites the owner's finger off and the owner doesn't want to surrender the dog immediately, or to have it walk by an adult, not a seven-year-old child with a leash that's fit for a chihuahua so he can lose control of it in the middle of onset and rip some child's face off or kill somebody. We're looking to protect the town of Wareham and anybody who comes to this town. And these dogs are dangerous. They're a loaded gun. And all we're looking to do is implement some extra safety precautions, not for a dog that eats a goldfish, but for a dog that bites a finger off. These are real situations. They're in the news every single day. Dogs kill people. We're trying to save lives. And as far as the barking dog, right now, if we go under the uh, noise disturbance, Basically, if the dog barks and we can hear him 150 feet away, he's in violation. 30 seconds. What we need is clarity. Dog, I'm a dog owner. My dogs want to bark. I think they should be allowed to bark, but you need to set a time frame. What's reasonable and what's not? And that's what we're trying to do is have clarity. So we don't have somebody calling when a dog barks 
three times, we're saying this is a reasonable amount of time for a dog to bark. We're looking for the dogs that are tied to a tree, barking 24 hours a day, driving their neighbors crazy, and we want to address those concerns for what they are, a barking dog. Time. On my left. Uh, I'm going to offer a motion for further study on the article, and uh, I believe I've given that to you already, Madam Moderator, and that I've already given it to uh, Mr. Underhill, so perhaps we could get that up on the screen. Yes, and if, and if you would care to read it. Uh, yes, I hereby move that the body vote further study on Article 32 and further that the body approve the formation of a dog regulation bylaw study committee, said committee to be composed of the following members, the animal control officer, a member of the board of selectmen to be chosen by that body, and three citizen members to be appointed by an appointing authority consisting of the chairman of the board of selectmen, the town administrator, and the town moderator. Said dog regulation bylaw study committee shall meet no less often than once per month for the purpose of examining issues relating to the definition and regulation of excessively barking dogs, potentially dangerous dogs, and dangerous dogs. In the event a majority of members shall agree upon the terms of same, the dog bylaw study committee shall work with town council to draft and propose relevant bylaws in accordance with Mass General Laws Chapter 140, Sections 173 and 173A, addressing the above referenced issues for consideration by the fall 2012 town meeting body and in any event shall submit either a consensus or a majority and minority reports to the fall 2012 town meeting body. Do I have a second? Second. A second. To speak to your amendment? Look, I, I, I spoke at length with, with the animal control officer on Saturday. Uh, she, she was at my property over an hour and I would characterize the conversation as a pleasant one. She's earnest, she's hardworking, she's trying to do her job. The problem is, isn't that. The problem is this law that's being proposed. If you take a look at number two, under the Barking and Howling Nuisance Remedies section, there's a, a, a standard set forth by which uh, the animal control officer or any police officer enforcing the law is supposed to operate. They talk about barking for a certain period of time, audible to a certain distance, and then immediately afterwards it goes on to say or in the discretion of the animal control officer. That just wipes out all the verbiage that came before it. It gives the animal control officer utter discretion to determine what the barking nuisance is. Now, I don't have a problem with this particular animal control officer, but we've had some real doozies in this town before. We've had some that like to shoot dogs. We've had some nuts in the position. And while I, I can appreciate that the current dog officer is not one of these people, I hate to write a regulation that's going to stay on the books and authorize that kind of uh, decision making by somebody who, who really sh shouldn't have that much discretion. And, and to go with the barking, uh, the dangerous dogs, we keep seeing the terms provoked and unprovoked. But there are no definitions. And so, you know, potentially, as somebody said, a, a dog running on its own property and barking along a fence at passes by could be deemed a potentially dangerous dog. There aren't any definitions. So we need really to, to study this matter further. Uh, to put together a board, and a board that would include the animal control officer for her input, uh, to study this further and come up with a better law that will enable her to do her job while protecting owner's rights. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Matt, do you have the written words that you could put up on the screen? Do you have it that we could put it up on the screen? No? Okay. Um, Mrs. Winslow. Thank you, Madam Moderator. I would support further study in a committee to look at this. These are serious issues. Um, I do believe that the animal control officer is, is attempting to move the community in a, in a good direction here. However, uh, I can tell you right now that if my dog bites my finger off, she won't be leaving my house without that dog. So, you know, there is, there is a level of personal accountability and responsibility. If your animal bites you or, or somebody else and, and injures you, you have a responsibility to make a decision and decide what to do with that animal. We have a rule in my house, dog bites, dog goes. Simple. Do I like it? No. But the dogs know the rule and all we have to do is say animal control. It works. <laughs> Gentlemen on my right. I, I support the proposed amendment. Uh, I support all of the goals of the original article, and I think we, 
together we can make an article that is clear and accomplishes those goals, please re refer it for study to a committee that will put in some time and effort on this and come up with a lasting article. Thank you. The gentleman on my left. Madam Moderator, I would like to move the question. Thank you. We have a motion to move the question. It requires a two-thirds vote. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Passes. We now will vote on the amendment, and I will read it slowly for you. The motion before us to on the amendment is I hereby move that the body vote further study on Article 32, and further that the body approve the formation of a dog regulation bylaw study committee, said committee to be composed of the following members, the animal control officer, a member of the Board of Selectmen to be chosen by that body, and three citizen members to be appointed by an appointing authority consisting of the Chairman of the Board of Selectmen, the Town Administrator, and the Town Moderator. Said Dog Reg Regulation Bylaw Study Committee shall meet no less often than once per month for the purpose of examining issues relating to the definition and regulation of excessively barking dogs, potentially dangerous dogs, and dang dangerous dogs. In the event a majority of members shall agree upon the terms of same, the Dog Bylaw Study Committee shall work with Town Council to draft and propose relevant bylaws in accordance with the Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 140, Section 173 and 173A, addressing the above reference issues for consideration by the Fall 2012 Town Meeting Body and in any event shall submit either a consensus or majority and minority report to the Fall 2010 Town Meeting Body. Any questions on what I just read? The amendment is now before you. It requires a majority vote. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed? No. Passes by majority. The amendment now becomes the main motion. Again, it requires a majority vote. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed? No. The motion passes. The number doesn't want to come out. <laughs> Article 36. We just have just these two more. Article 36, may I have a motion? Madam Moderator, Article 36, I move that the town vote to approve the article as printed in the warrant. May I have a second? <coughs> to speak to the article? Yes. On my left? Yes, Madam Moderator, George Barrett, Chairman of the Planning Board. Uh, Planning Board held a public hearing on Article 36 on April 9th and voted unanimously in favor of the Article 400. Uh, what you have before you is adapting the new FEMA uh, flood maps that were updated over the past, I think they started in 2008. Uh, it's when this was first uh, given to us, it had very little backup information and we were a little apprehensive. But after uh, approving, putting it on the warrant and delving into it a little more deeply, I think everyone has a little better level of comfort with it, especially after the presentation given by FEMA and DCR oh, a week and a half ago. They, they came to Wayham and gave a very thorough uh, explanation of what they've done. What this the gist of this is they've improved their mapping, uh, they've gotten better information, they've recorded all the, they've summarized all the changes that individual property owners might have made and incorporated it, <coughs> those into their flood maps. Um, basically the, uh, the information seems to have improved, it takes local conditions into consideration rather than just a blanket elevation to consider whether you need flood insurance or not. Um, the most important thing about Article 36 is a failure to 
adopt this, adopt it, would lead to the inability of people to attain flood insurance. Uh, if you have it now, you could continue it, but if there was any changes in your policy, if there was, and you lost your coverage, you wouldn't be able to reinstate it. Uh, I would urge that you approve it. Uh, as I said, we on the Planning Board had some apprehension about it, and we did look for the typical unintended consequences and haven't found any. So I would urge the approval. Thank you. Is there anything further to be said on Article 36? Seeing no one standing, I now call for a vote. This is a, um, we are amending the bylaws. It does require a two-thirds vote. I will try for a voice vote. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, passes unanimously. I believe this is our last article. Article 43. May I have a motion? Yes, Madam Moderator. I move that the town vote to approve the article as printed in the warrant. Can I have a second? To speak to the article? Eddie Pesevich, Precinct 1. Uh, problems identified by the Clean Water Committee involving the current earth removal bylaw. The current bylaw does not protect Zone 2, the majority of which is located in the upper northeast corner of Wareham in the vicinity of Glen Charlie Road from earth removal activities. Does not clearly define the meaning of earth removal. Does not clearly define the agricultural exemption for earth removal. Our current zoning bylaws prohibit mining in Zone 2. Other zoning bylaws prohibit earth removal in residential zone, zone R130, which includes most of Zone 2. What is the difference between mining and earth removal? Because of these confusing issues, the town is losing additional revenue from the fees for earth removal. Section 1 of the proposed bylaw change includes the protection of groundwater and our aquifer. Section 2 of the proposed bylaw change will clearly define the meaning of earth removal and provide other much needed definitions. Section 3 of the proposed bylaw change will protect our drinking water by prohibiting earth removal activities in Zone 2 as identified on the Town of Wareham zoning map. Zone 2 is the recharge area for the Plymouth Carver Aquifer. Zone 2 has been scientifically identified as the area in which rain passes through the ground and enters the aquifer. The sand in this area filters the rainwater before it enters the aquifer, removing many of the pollutants. Earth removal activities in Zone 2 could adversely affect the purity of our drinking water. Our zoning bylaws currently prohibit earth removal in residential Zone R130. 98% of Zone 2, the majority of which is located in the northeast corner of Wareham, is in Zone R130. No new earth removal operations can take place in Zone R130, which covers most of Zone 2. There is only one permitted earth removal operation, Sand Pit, in Wareham and is located in Zone 2 off of Glen Charlie Road. It was an operation prior to the establishment of the zoning bylaws. This business is located in Braintree, and the owner of this business has other earth removal operations in Massachusetts. The earth removal operation was grandfathered with regards to the zoning bylaws. There is no grandfathering for a general bylaw or for these proposed bylaw changes. The Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection, DEP, developed a report titled Model Zone 2 Conservation Restriction for Public Drinking Water Supply Protection. This model provides that earth removal activities in Zone 2 should be prohibited. Section 4A of the proposed bylaw changes establishes exemptions, exemptions in accordance with the Mass General Laws. Section 4B of the proposed bylaw changes clearly defines the agricultural exemption using the definition implemented by the Town of Carver. It provides that earth removal, uh, which is removed and sold, is not part of an agricultural exemption, but is part of an earth removal operation. This concept has been affirmed in the court case of Kathleen B. Henry versus the Board of Appeals of Dunstable, Massachusetts. 
This change will eliminate the loophole that currently exists and has been used in the past and will ensure that the town of Wareham receives all of the money it's due from earth removal operations. For example, removal of 400,000 cubic yards of earth will provide the town with $100,000 in fees. Section 5A, Section 5A of the proposed bylaw will prohibit earth removal activities within 400 feet of away, public or private, as is the case in the town of Lakeville. Section 5B of the proposed bylaw will limit earth removal activities to the area 10 feet above the historical high groundwater table to protect groundwater, as is the case in the town of Kingston. The current earth removal bylaw does not have any restrictions regarding earth removal activities and the historical high groundwater. Section 6 of the proposed bylaw provides clarifications, corrections, and minor changes to the existing removal bylaw. I urge you to vote in favor of these proposed changes to the earth removal bylaw Time. in order to complete the overall protection of our drinking water, recharge area, zone 2, and to ensure in these difficult financial times the town receives all of the money it is due. Thank, Thank you. you. May I have the vote of the Board of Selectmen? Madam Moderator, the Board of Selectmen voted favorable action, two in favor, one opposed, and zero abstentions. May I have the vote and recommendation of the Finance Committee? Uh, Madam Moderator, the Finance Committee voted favorable action, zero in favor, eight against, and zero abstentions. And the reason this article prohibits certain businesses from operating as they have for over 50 years. These businesses were in place prior to the fire district installing wells. The Department of Environmental Protection would have never permitted the fire district from installing their wells in this area if an environmental issue were present. In fact, the DEP model regulations allow for earth removal in a zone two with a groundwater separation of four feet. This article will put businesses out of work. It, this article should not be put forth for consideration at town meeting until adequate scientific evidence has been presented and evaluated by the town's appropriate municipal boards, committees, and agents. Thank you. Selectman Winslow. Thank you, Madam Moderator. I'd like to make an amendment to this article and amend it for further study. Do I have a second? We have an amendment before us for further study to speak to the amendment. Mrs. Slackman Winslow. This article has been before us before and it's been voted down. I do believe that this is something that will require a great deal of effort to look at uh, before we go ahead and put these types of regulations on existing businesses. Um, so I, I think it should be looked at a little closer. Thank you. To speak to the amendment, on my left. Uh, John Degas, District 3. Uh, just to the amendment, uh, Madam Moderator. Just to the amendment. Well, I, I will support the amendment, and I will, um, I will indicate that myself and, and the Cranberry industry will, uh, will participate with the town of Wayham in studying this matter and coming to a, the same kind of conclusion, hopefully, that has been adopted unanimously in towns like Carver where they have adopted uh, these kinds of bylaws that bring in the kind of revenue that the previous speaker talked about and did it in a way that protected the interests of the town, number one, the roads, the neighbors around the Cranberry Bogs and the Cranberry Growers themselves. These bylaws uh, that have been, pros uh, been uh, uh, proposed here tonight would virtually eliminate many normal cultural practices that are conducted by Cranberry Growers and have been for many, many years. I'll begin by raising a legal challenge to, to that proposal. Um, these proposed bylaws include a total prohibition uh, of earth removal in a Zone 2 area. Uh, zone 2 area contains about 20% of our cranberry bogs, but it, it, it goes beyond just cranberries. It goes with all earth removal. Uh, this proposal is so extreme that it would make Wayham the only town in Massachusetts with a total prohibition uh, of, of, of earth removal uh, in a zone two. That is excessive beyond reason. 30 seconds. In addition to that, it is, it is uh, in conflict with state bylaws, uh, with state laws which allow earth removal in a zone two. The town can modify minimum state uh, uh, conditions, 
but it cannot totally appropriate, I cannot uh, uh, totally prohibit what state law allows. Uh, this alone is basis for, for uh, turning this uh, um, amendment down and, and, uh, and uh, adopting the uh, further study amendment. I, I do have a couple more minutes, but I think I've said enough. It's, it's getting late, Time. and I support the, amend the amendment. Thank you. I believe the gentleman on my left behind Mr. Dekas was next on my left. Uh, Brock Tusi, District 6. Um, I support everything John said. I was going to basically say the same thing. But I'd like to add that uh, when this started, I believe it was started for me. Um, um, just to speak to the amendment for further the amendment, study. Well, the amendment for further study, you should, people should have information for the study. And since this started, the last meeting, it was told to us that this might put people out of business. This is a reason for further study. It's done that. Okay. A family owned business was first bought in 1869 is now owned by a group from Burlington, Vermont. That would be mine. This is embarrassing. It's tough to say. But this is what this has done. Please, don't let it go any further. This eliminates cranberry bugs for any further production, never mind the rest of it. So thank you for your time. Gentlemen on my right. Uh, to speak to the amendment, Eddie Pasevich, this has no effect whatsoever on cranberry bugs. This is strictly earth removal. Look at the bylaw. It exempts cranberry bogs. It exempts any activity with cranberry bogs and the normal use of cranberry bogs. It has got nothing to do with it. It only deals with earth removal. And that is not a cranberry bog operation. Thank you. On my left. Madam Moderator, could I defer some of my time to Mr. Dekas? No. All right. I just saw him get up. Um, Madam Moderator, I, uh, I'm actually opposed um, to the article, but I certainly would be inclined to support the amendment, uh, even though um, I think that um, there is so many things wrong with this, and it's just another case where we're crying wolf over and over again. So um, rather than vote the whole thing down, because there may, ha there may be some sections of it that have merit, uh, maybe voting for further study would be a good compromise. Gentleman on my right. Uh, Madam Chairman, I'd make a motion to move the question. We, <laughs> we have a motion to move the, re the question. It does require a two-thirds vote. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, it passes. We now will vote on the amendment for further study. Requires majority vote. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed? No. The amendment passes. The amendment now becomes the main motion. The main motion before you is for further study of Article 43. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed? No. The amendment passes. The, the, uh, Article 43 passes by a majority. Madam Moderator, I make a motion to adjourn town meeting. I have a motion to adjourn and seconded. Madam Moderator. The motion and and dissolve. Dissolve. And, and dissolve. And dissolve. Ladies and gentlemen, don't forget we have a special town meeting on May 21st. It starts at 7.30, not 7 o'clock, 7.30. I hope you will please come and be here. It has several very important uh, articles on it that do need to be addressed. So please return on the 21st. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Courtney Petrowski, Outreach Coordinator at Wareham Community Television. As you may know, WCTV is your source for live coverage of town meetings, Board of Selectmen meetings, and other municipal meetings, as well as local parades, Gateman games, and school sporting events. What you may not know is WCTV is also home to a wide variety of locally produced original programming made by your Wareham neighbors. From morning talk shows to live music events to health and wellness programs, WCTV can help you put your ideas on television. Hey folks, my name is Bruce Gannon. I uh, moved to Wareham back in the summer of 2009 and uh, in the fall of 2009 was introduced to the wonderful world of WCTV. I came to Wareham in 2003 uh, and I couldn't wait for this station to open up. My name is Linnell Butterfield. I live in Wareham and have for the past 12 years. I've been involved with Wareham Community Television since uh, they moved to this building about three years. My name is Mike Dunphy. Um, I'm 24 years old. Uh, I've lived in Wareham my whole life. I'm Patty Rumney and I host your daily gumbo. I'm a volunteer, I'm a member, and I view myself as an independent producer. I decided to do something a little different and launched Feel the Music, which is a live music show. I produce, direct, edit, um, shoot, work sound on a TV show that we have called At the Hub. I'm just looking to, to make music and to also incorporate the music with that visual, which I think people are looking to see. Bringing out the positives in Wareham rather than focusing on negatives. That's my goal. So I have a couple of things. History, technology, and being informed and, and an edu educational mission. We do this live show and because I wanted the bands to be able to uh, have an audience. I've gotten people on the show uh, who are in various sports and commissions in the town to explain to us what they do, what are their purposes, because I think most people don't really know. I'm working on a program called I Wonder Where the Yellow Went, which is a story of Wareham sewer system. We have the show on Wednesday nights and it's great. We have uh, live acts from around southeastern uh, Massachusetts and Rhode Island. We have some interesting guests. We've had animal chiropractors, acupuncturists, human chiropractors, um, an equine assisted therapist, belly dancers. Oh, no, I haven't had no formal training. Nothing on a real professional level. No formal background. Nothing. That's one of the beauties of working as a volunteer at a place like WCTV. You don't need a lot of experience or any experience at all to come down and learn how to do what we do here. The expertise was here and it was it's willing expertise. I just think it's fun. Why do I keep doing it? It's a lot of fun. I'm really enjoying my time here. Keep watching. <laughs> for more information on these shows and the full program lineup for each of our stations and internet stream, visit us at www.wareham.tv.org. And don't just watch TV, make it. Thank you for watching WCTV. Tired of paying high bank fees? It's not about the fees, it's, it's really about you when you come here. Why not join PCT Federal Credit Union, formed by educators and now open to the entire Wareham community? Unlike most banks, the credit union has no annual credit card fees, free checking, free ATM withdrawals, and generally lower loan rates. And we are a not-for-profit organization, which means we can focus on serving members rather than maximizing our profit. Banks didn't know my name. Never mind that I had a husband and a son. Some banks you go, it's banking. You're doing this, you're doing a your service, and you're leaving. Here, it's, it's just friendly. The people are what makes a big difference. Join the credit union family at Plymouth County Teachers Federal Credit Union.